sound check. Good morning po. Naririnig po ako. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you po. Good morning, Attorney Chan. Good morning, Good morning, sir. Ano po yung pag ano, pag pag uh, pag palit ng background, uh, change background ba yon? Back. Si Apo, doon sa ah. may ano, sa may ah, add image. Apo, add ah, okay. image. Add image. Tapos sir, yung in-email kong bagong background. Oo. Apo, yun lang po. Tek na lang. Zoom. Anong breakfast niyo, sir? Ang ano lang, pagkani. <laughs> Agutom ako. <laughs> Yan. Yan, sir. Okay na po. Oh, okay ni sir. Okay na. Okay. Eight o'clock mag-start, no? Eight o'clock uh, five po, sir. So, we're, we are targeting 75 packs po sana. Kaya lang okay. for the past two days po. Around 53 mm. ang participants natin from different MLGs po. Mm. Okay. Sige, antay lang po natin sir na ano, dumami yung participants okay. before tayo mag-upload po. Ha? Ay, okay naman yung audio sir. So kami yung mag-upload mag ng press party po. No? Oo. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. So I hope na maging stable naman lahat ng ating mga internet po. Kasi malakas yeah, yeah. ang ulan. Mulan lang. Oo nga po, sir. Sige, sir. Wait lang natin, ha? Okay. Thank you po.
Please stand by. We'll start in a short while. Thank you.
A pleasant and wonderful morning, everyone. Before we start, may I ask our Zoom participants to please give me a quick thumbs up so that I would know that you can hear me crystal clear. Mm -hmm. There you go. Thank you very much for to start our today's program. May I request everyone to put ourselves in the most mighty and holy presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Almighty and ever-loving God, we glorify and thank Thee, Your name. You have showered us with so much blessings, and Your presence continuously remind us of Your faithfulness and guidance. Please may we humbly ask You to shower our speaker today of Your greatest inspiration, so that he may share the most of our knowledge, heart, and soul to his topic. May we also absorb the invaluable knowledge, experiences, and put it into practice that we may learn today. We pray that you bless all the committees in charge, that they may be able to fulfill their task responsibly, that the objectives they have set may all be achieved. Your infinite blessing would mean the success of this training. May we be a living witnesses of your genuine love through the enactment of the knowledge acquired through this activity. We ask these in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Amen. Once again, a blessed Wednesday morning to everyone. And this is your facilitator, Monica Marie Sadia from the Capacity Development Division. And welcome to the third day of the online training for the Municipal Local Government Units on Government Procurement Reform Act or the Republic Act number 9184 and its 2016 revised implementing rules and regulations brought to you by none other than the Government Procurement Policy Board Technical Support Office. Just a quick recap lang po of yesterday's learning session. We had a very much productive learning session on procurement planning and budget linkage, including early procurement activities, where we had a, an extent, extensive discussion on the fundamentals of procurement planning and where we highlighted the project Procurement Management Plan and Annual Procurement Plan. Towards the end of the lecture proper, we had an in-depth discussion on the scope and applications of the conduct of early procurement activities led, of course, by our resource speaker, Ms. Gracela Ortiz. Today, I am ecstatic because we are now on the fourth learning session of this virtual event, which is an entire session on standard bidding procedures for goods, infrastructure projects, and consulting services. We are now po in midway towards the end of our virtual event, and we hope po na napupuno na natin ang ating mga notepads with all of the information that we have discussed over the past days. And we know po, no, perhaps um, today we may feel a particularly uh, sleepy feeling because of Bagyong Jolina. And I heard po, no, as I am heading um, my way to the office po, no, ang sabi po ng uh, morning news is that another storm po has entered the Philippine area of responsibility under the name of Bagyong Kiko. So we are all crossing both our fingers po, no, that our internet connectivity shall be as smooth and uh, rest assured po that today's learning session shall be as sunny and as productive because again in TSO, hashtag we make things happen. But before we dive in the actual lecture proper, of course, let us first jump right through the announcement of the early bird awardees for today. So congratulations po to our early bird participants from LGU Lasam Cagayan, Ma'am Selly Adolfo, and from LGU Madela Quirino, Sir Renny Basug. Ayan, despite the wet, bad weather po, no? Yun nga po ang sabi po nila. Our early bird participants managed to still join, um, I believe, an hour earlier pa din po. So congratulations po once again. And our event secretariat shall coordinate with you on how you may claim your special token. And speaking of that, may I once again remind po all the winners of, pre of our previous learning sessions to please shoot us an email with the details needed for the sending and distribution of your respective special tokens. Also, please accomplish po the participants' daily attendance, day three, by clicking the link provided by the uh, event secretariat as this will be part of the requirements for the provision of 
your respective certificates. Rest assured po that all information provided shall be treated with utmost discretion and confidentiality. Finally po, for those who have not registered yet, in our GPPBTSO Online Training Management System or OTMS, kindly register na po by using the assigned control number. I would also like no, to stress this po, especially, especially po to our learning sessions winners. Because I am afraid po na baka ma-forfeit. And of course, uh, we don't want that to happen. No? Um, so please kindly um, register na po through our GPPBTSO ODMS. Now that uh, all, I think everything is all set, I wouldn't keep you any longer, any more longer na po. No? So please allow me to introduce to you with great pleasure, this learning sessions resource speaker. Our resource speaker formerly served as the Assistant Secretary for Procurement and the Director for Legal Service of the Department of Transportation. He holds the rank of CESO 1, the highest rank in the career executive service. Prior to joining government, he worked as an associate at the ACRA Law Office and a consultant at the Asian Development Bank Administrative Tribunal. He is also a member of the Faculty of the College of Law of the University of the Philippines and the University of the East, where he teaches various civil and commercial law subjects. He obtained his Bachelor of Laws degree, cum laude, from the University of the Philippines and his Bachelor of Science in Legal Management degree, cum laude, from the Ateneo de Manila University. Also, he obtained his Master of Business Administration degree from the University of Bradford and his Master of Laws degree from the University of Durham in the United Kingdom as a British government scholar. He completed levels one to three of the public procurement specialist certification course conducted by the government procurement and policy board through the University of the Philippines National Engineering Center. Currently the chief privatization officer of the privatization and management office and a GPPB recognized trainer. Joining us today, ladies and gentlemen, attorney Gerard L. Chan. Hello, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is uh, safe and uh, well at home. So welcome to the, I, th I heard that it is in the midway of your uh, lecture series already. So I hope you're enjoying uh, the topics that are being discussed on a day-to-day -day basis. No, for, so let's start immediately because the, the topic assigned to me is quite long. So this is a lecture on the standard bidding procedure for goods, infra, and consulting. Okay, so this is going to be a quite a long uh, discussion covering all the salient uh, procedures and salient requirements, as well as the salient updates no, on uh, goods, infra, and consulting. So we'll cover the basics, of course, as well as the uh, advanced information about these three kinds of procurement. Next slide. So the purpose of this lecture, as I mentioned, is to understand the key concepts. Okay, so the key concepts, the important, uh, uh, the important parts in goods, infra, and consulting, and undertake uh, procurement activities involving infrastructure projects in compliance with 9184 and the uh, 2016 IRR. Next slide. Okay, so this lecture is divided into two parts. Okay, uh, first we go with uh, we discuss the general principles and considerations, and the second part when we when we dive into the uh, intricacies of procurement of goods, infra, and consulting. Next slide. So let's start with the with the first part. No? General principles and considerations. So what is the overarching concept or overarching principle in 1984 it is the principle or the concept of competitive bidding but this is the common denominator among all this uh procedure the requirement for competitive bidding the basic rule general rule and the exception is when you go to alternative methods of procurement only in highly exceptional cases and the 
and the exceptional cases are found in 9184 itself. Okay? So you don't invent your own, uh, own reason or your own case uh, or, or your own cases. No, it's there in the uh, rules and it's there in the IRR itself. So this is the general rule. So if, if uh, the meaning of this is that if your case or your procurement doesn't fall under any of the alternative methods of procurement under rule, uh, rule, six, uh, rule 16 of the IRR, then you go the default no? uh, by, by competitive bidding. There is a separate lecture, I understand, uh, to cover the alternative methods of procurement. Next slide. So we will be discussing for this lecture the competitive bidding, the general format. Okay. So the purpose of competitive bidding is, under this case, to, to protect public interest uh, by getting the best possible advantage through uh, open competition and to avoid or preclude suspicious, suspicion of uh, favoritism and anomalies. Because if the, if, the, if the competitors, if the bidders compete among themselves, then government is able to get the, the best deal, the best value. Because if there's no competition, then you're, you're, uh, no, you're, you're stuck with one or two suppliers, one or two contractors, or even just one uh, supplier because there's no competition. But if all of them compete, then you'll be able to, to, you're able to assure yourself that you're getting the best price no? for the best value for your money. Next slide. So another general principle or concept in procurement is if there's no APP, then there's no procurement. Meaning you see here in the screen, in the APP, you will see the list of the projects or the items that will be procured. And it is also indicated uh, in the APP, the mode of procurement, if it's competitive bidding or alternative methods of procurement. Okay. So all of this must be approved in the annual procurement. APP is the annual procurement plan. Okay. So if the item is not found in the annual procurement plan, then there is no reason or there is no basis for you to undertake that procurement. So that's number one basic step to check if that item is included in the approved annual procurement plan. Next slide. So goods and services. Next slide. So this part talks about what, what, is, uh, what are goods, what are infra, and what are uh, consulting. So what are goods? No? Goods cover not just the, the physical, of course, goods start, we start with your physical goods, the things that you can see and you can touch, you know, like, uh, Office equipment, uh, furniture, and fixture, but it is not limited to, to that. It also includes repairs, uh, subscriptions, and uh, licenses, as well as services. Services such as janitorial and uh, security services, tracking and polling services, uh, supplies and materials. So these are goods and services. Next slide. Infra. What are infra? What, what is covered under infra. So you see here, here in the slide, no pictures of <clears throat> what are covered uh, under infra. So these are covered under, under infra. Next slide. How about consulting? Consulting among covers this one. Uh, advisory and review services, pre-investment or feasibility studies, design, construction supervision, uh, training programs, management and related services, and other technical uh, services or special studies. So these are covered under uh, consulting. Next slide. So we're still under, in, under general principles. No? So we've defined what is goods, infra, and consulting. So basically, when you're, when you're dealing with a procurement, pro, uh, procurement project, no? you first ask yourself, what kind of procurement are we dealing with? Is it goods, is it infra, or is it consulting? Because the procedures uh, are not the same for all these three uh, kinds of procurement. So you have to be very clear what kind of procurement is uh, being uh, is involved. Next is the bidding procedure. We, 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 we know this, yung, the submission of the two, the two envelope system. So like in this case, you will see two envelope system so you, you submit all your bid in one envelope and the inside the envelope are the uh, two main envelopes, the financial envelope and the technical envelope. 
if it's electronic procurement, if it's electronic submission, I mean, online submission of bids, then it is, uh, it, it also, it also uh, consists of two, not two aspects or two parts, a technical with its own password and the financial bid uh, with its own password and the main uh, bid with its own password. So it's called two password protected bidding documents. Next slide. Next slide. So who are eligible? Uh, who are the eligible bidders? As a general rule, these are the eligible bidders, duly licensed Filipino citizens, sole proprietorship, corporations with at, with at least 60% uh, Filipino interest or ownership, cooperatives duly organized under the laws of the Philippines, foreign bidders okay, treat, un, under ter, for, treaty or international or executive agreements, partnership with at least 60% Filipino ownership, or interest and joint ventures with at least 60% uh, Philippine interest ownership. Next slide. So foreign equity requirement in government procurement. This is uh, under EO65 uh, series of 2018. So there's an amendment on foreign uh, equity requirement. Before it was 75%. Now it uh, it provides that partnerships duly organized under the laws of the Philippines with at least sixty percent, sixty percent interest. So sixty percent uh, belong which belongs to the citizens of the Philippines are allowed to participate in the uh, public bidding. Okay, so sixty percent corporations also the sixty forty rule. Okay, persons entities forming themselves into joint venture, Filipino ownership uh, shall be sixty percent. So it became uniform, sixty percent uh, ownership, including for partnerships. Next slide. When to hire consultants. This is also an important uh, thing to remember. Okay. The following are, are considered in, in hiring a consultant. Number one, the consultant must have the expertise, experience, and capability. Cost uh, may be included in a factor in selection. We'll discuss later the ways of evaluating uh, the bidding for consultancy services. And where applicable, technology and knowledge transfer shall be required in the provision of consulting services. So there must be a provision, if possible, uh, when applicable, that uh, the consultant not just does the, the things no, na in a sign sa kanya dun sa contract, but also dapat after the contract, there is somehow a technology and knowledge transfer so that the, the people in the agency are able to to be able to do it by themselves. That's the idea. After the consultant leaves, the people, the plantilla personnel in the agency are able to do it even without the consultant. May technology transfer. Now, if it's possible, like for instance, the equipments, uh, the, the, the people in the agency are able to be trained on how to use the equipments, how to operate the equipments on their own without, without necessarily uh, getting another consultant again. Next slide. So the hiring of the consultant, it is based on, we'll, we'll discuss later on, no, it's highest rated bid or highest rated responsive bid compared to goods and infra. In goods and infra, we have the concept of lowest uh, calculated and responsive bid. So pababaan sila for goods and infra, pababaan sila ng, ng price, price yung labanan. But in consulting, it's highest rated and responsive bid. Pataasan sila ng qualification, pataasan sila ng, ng concept, ng design. Now, that's the, the way we do the, the rating of the consultant. Next slide. Observers. 9184 also requires that we invite uh, observers in, in uh, various stages of the proceeding. So you see here, now there must be at least three observers. This is an important requirement, no? the, the, the requirement to invite observers. Because if you forget to invite observers, then the bidders could, could later on question the bidding as being invalid because you you forgot to invite the observer. So the rules require that you invite at least three observers. Now one is of course your COA, your in-house uh, COA representative, and then a duly recognized private sector group and an NGO. The the list is in the rules. Who uh, may be invited from the private sector group and who may be invited from the NGO? Uh, it's provided in the guidelines in the rules. Uh, they must be invited in writing at least five calendar days before the date of the following activity. So for these activities, you must invite them 
five calendar days before the pre-bid conference. And the post qualification. Okay. Whether they, ano, whether they uh, attend or not, it doesn't really matter. What is important is that you're able to show that you invited them in writing uh, five days before the date of this activity. Okay, next slide. So this is a new provision. The observers must be given online access to, to, to the, pro the, the, the procurement activities. So online monitoring for uh, observers using the M field jets, procuring entity to provide online access to observers for monitoring all stages of the procurement using the, the M field jets. Okay. Procurement, procuring entities must also inform the GPPB DSO if online access can be provided. So, this is a new requirement, uh, new rule found in Circular 1 2021. So, in view of the work from home and uh, and the situation we're in right now, even the observers do it uh, through online. Next slide. So we have knowledge. Check. All right. Thank you, Potter. Nene, uh, we remind po the participants to please keep your microphones muted so as not to disrupt po our lecture. So again, po, we will be flashing our knowledge check questions through the Zoom polling feature. And all we have to do is choose the appropriate answer in the pop-up. Uh, Paul, that shall be flashed in our screen. So for our knowledge check question number one, which of the following is not considered as goods? Letter A, analogous services. Letter B, subscription and licenses. Letter C, office equipment. Letter D, design and build. Or letter E, security and janitorial services. Again, the question is, which of the following is not considered as goods is it analogous services subscription and licenses office equipment design and build or security and janitorial services All right, so I think we reached the majority. Attorney, majority of our participants answered letter D, design and build. Is yes. that correct, Bo? Yes, that is correct on design and build. So you will see here, uh, the main question, not considered goods. So you will see, uh, as uh, the slide earlier showed, no. so we have analogous services, sub subscription licenses, obviously office equipment, security and gender services, except design and build. Design and build is uh, not under uh, goods, but rather under uh, infra, design and build. All right, thank you, Father Nee. We may now proceed to the lecture proper. So let's continue, next slide. So let's now go to the main part of this, main point uh, portion of this lecture, which is the competitive bidding procedure and requirement. As I mentioned earlier, we will be discussing goods, infra, and consulting. So let's start with the standard competitive bidding procedure for goods and services. So this is the flow chart. Okay, so in goods, we have pre-procurement, okay, pre-procurement conference, which is internal to the agency, and then advertisement, seven calendar days, pre-bid conference. After the pre-bid conference is the actual submission of bids. After the bids are submitted, then you open the first and second envelope. We'll discuss this in detail later on. And then the bid evaluation and ranking, and then post qualification and award of the contract. You will see in the screen also the number of days, you know, the prescribed number of days uh, for each of these activities. Next slide. For infra, it is uh, the same. You know? The flowchart is the same, except just the number of days are a bit different, a longer your number of days. But in terms of the steps, uh, they are the same. So in terms of uh, this part submission of visit would be either 50 calendar days or 60, 65 uh, calendar days. Okay, so this is the, the difference, uh, goods compared to infra. Next slide. 
in consulting, then it's a bit different. Consulting uh, sets is a different, uh, part sets it apart from goods and uh, infra. In consulting, we have this extra step of eligibility check and shortlisting. So the concept or idea of shortlisting is only found in consulting. We have shortlisting. And after shortlisting, only those shortlisted participants are allowed or are included in the, or are allowed, are joining, will join the uh, free bid conference. Uh, and then they submit Pwede the shortlisted participants yun. are uh, submit their bids in the bid opening. And another uh, distinct feature of consulting is there is negotiation. You will see here in the flowchart, there is negotiation before the post one. So these two distinct features of consulting, no? there's shortlisting and there is a negotiation, which is not found in uh, goods and infra. Next slide. So recommended possible period to complete the procurement activity for goods. So the earliest day is 26 days, the shortest possible time, and the longest This is for uh, approval of higher authority. We'll, we'll learn later on, we'll discuss later on. It, when, when it comes to contract approval, there are agencies which need higher uh, approval by higher, yung mga mother agency, for instance, or yung mga may boards at GOCC. So higher approval. But it's not, count, it's not included in the counting of the number of days. So 26 for goods, uh, shortest, and the longest is 136 days. Next slide. For infra, shortest is still 26 days, but the longest, it could be 156 days. Uh, the longest could be either 141 days or 156 days. Remember a while ago, when you see 50 calendar days or 65 calendar days. So that, that accounts for the difference here, depending on the type of uh, infra projects we're talking about. So it could either be as short as 141 maximum or 156 maximum. Again, this excludes the approval of higher authority if required. Next slide. For consulting, the earliest period is 36 days and the longest period is uh, 180 days. Again, excluding the approval of the higher authorities that are applicable. So take note of this, this is important, meaning you must be able to finish the whole procurement activity from uh, a maximum of, uh, you can do it as short as 36, but the maximum, maximum period that you, you have to complete the procurement activity is 180 days. Otherwise, you'll have a problem. Okay, next slide. So approval of higher authority, it was mentioned a while ago. If there's a need, and if there's a need to approve, uh, uh, to have the contract, or the procurement approved uh, by a higher authority, then it's 20 days from receipt to approve or disapprove the contract by the hope, no? 20 days for the hope. But if there's a higher approval, let's say there's a board, GOCC's board, for instance, then it's 30 days uh, for the hope or for the GOC, the board, for instance, to approve the, uh, no, the, the contract. Remember, later on, we'll discuss when the BAC issues a recommendation, the hope would approve or disapprove. The, the, the contract. So these are the approval, the number of days that the, up the contract could be approved. Okay. Next slide. The use of digital signatures. Procurement officers and officials may digitally or electronically sign the procurement documents. So this was a uh, approved or allowed under GPPB resolution 16-2019 and 9-2020. So for this, you see in the screen, for these uh, documents, digital signatures are allowed. Maybe you, especially, especially now that we're all uh, work from home. Uh, so PPM, PPMP, APP, RFQ, PBD, invitation to bid, supplemental bid bulletin, notice of postponement, and then here, no? Um, uh, notice of eligibility, shortlisting, abstract of quotation, abstract of bids, bid evaluation report, notice to the LCB, HRB. And then even the post call report, notice of post uh, disqualification, notice of award, approval of higher authority, notice to proceed, and the back resolutions. All of these uh, are allowed uh, to use 
we allowed to use the digital signatures for this. So you will see it, it makes the procurement process more efficient you know, so that you don't have to wait, that, that you don't have to pass the paper around and wait for all the, the back members to sign because you can use the digital or electronic signatures. Next slide. Also, the use of video conferencing, webcasting, and similar technologies are allowed, right? So especially in determination of the forum, especially now, no, when we all work from home, we can expect everyone to be present in one place. So a member of the BAP, including the vice, uh, the chairperson and the vice chairperson, may be present either in person or face-to-face -face or through video conferencing, webcasting, or similar technology you know, for those uh, entities we have, which have that kind of technology. This actually take note that this video conferencing is allowed as early as 2018, as early as the GPB resolution 24-2018, even before COVID, this uh, electro, uh, video conferencing has already been allowed. Okay? Decisions made of at least a majority of the back members present using such technology shall be considered valid and binding. So this is not a new uh, development because this has already been allowed even before COVID. Okay? Next slide. So use of video conferencing is procurement activities that may be conducted electronically. Okay. So what portions of the what portions of the bidding process may be done through yeah through video conferencing? As I said, as early as 2018, it's already allowed the quick procurement conference, the bid opening, and all other procurement activities and meetings. Let's say there's a back meeting, okay, that, that needs to be done and someone is let's say abroad, then you can do it through video conferencing. Okay. Next slide. So now let's go to the steps, the step-by-step -step process of the procurement. Okay, so it's, it's the first step uh, is pre-procurement conference. But even before we advertise, pre-procurement is an internal process. But this, this doesn't involve the bidders yet. Internally lang to, inside the agency. The purpose of pre-procurement is to, the, to determine the readiness of the procurement. But you will, the, the agency should be uh, the back. Okay? The back and the agency should be confident that they're already, already ready to undertake this, pro, this, this procurement. And how do they uh, assure themselves that they are ready? So they will look at the timeline. What is the timeline for this uh, bidding? How many days do we plan to finish this bidding? Okay. Uh, condition, it is mandatory for projects above uh, with ABC above 2 million for goods, above 5 million for infra, and above 1 million for consulting. And who are involved in the pre-procurement conference, the BAC, the BAC secretary, the TWG, the consultants, if there are, the end user and other officials involved in the procurement. So it is conducted prior to the advertisement or posting of the invitation to bid. So the purpose is to determine the readiness. They will check the documents. They will check the invitation to bid, the bid docs, the, the funding and everything. And, and that everything is, they could also uh, discuss the timeline, you know, how, how fast or how, long do they intend to finish this procurement and all that. So all this must be discussed during the pre-procurement conference. And once they are confident that they are ready to undertake the procurement, that's the time they advertise. That's the time they launch the procurement. If something is still missing, documents or funding or what is still missing, then they will not, you know, they should not uh, launch the, the procurement. Next slide. So reference to brand names. The prohibition applies to procurement of goods and the goods component in, of infrastructure projects and consulting services. So it applies to goods. No, you should not be using or putting brand names in the uh, in the documents in the see in the uh, product uh, product specification about for goods. Uh, specification says you should be based on relevant characteristics, functionality, and performance requirement. So you, you do not put the brand name there. You should put the, what is the relevant characteristic of, of that particular product? So let's say you're procuring laptops. So you, you, don't, you don't put there the brand, let's say IBM. You put there that it has a, a, a hard disk of four gig. It has the speed of a RAM of two gig, yung mga ganon. But not put the brand name. Functionality that it has a Wi-Fi. It has, uh, it's able to have uh, three USB ports, you know, and it has, this is the speed and all that. You don't put the brand name, you just put the specification. 
except, it says here, there's an exception, except for items or parts that are compatible with the existing fleet or equipment of the same make and brand and to maintain the performance, functionality, and useful life of the equipment. So except if, if it is compatible with the existing. So you need a particular spare parts for this particular car, for instance. So you have to say that it is compatible with Toyota. So then that's the time you, 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 you have to put, the, you're allowed to put the, the brand name. This is found in section 18 of RA9184 and it's IRR. So take note when you're doing the, the, uh, the product specification for, for goods, for instance, you should not be using uh, brand names. Next slide. Uh, this is a new a new rule, no? Electronic submission and receipt of bids is now allowed under GPPB resolution-9-2020. Uh, of course, the BAC should decide, the agency should decide if they already have the, have the capability to undertake online or electronic submission of bids. If they have the capability, then they should put there in the invitation to bid, including the bidding documents to indicate that there is an option to do an online and electronic submission of bids if they have the capability. So there are two ways to do the online, uh, online or electronic submission of bids. Or do you do it through ele any electronic means? Again, if the agency has that has its capability, or you could use the GPPB online portal to, to submit your uh, online or electronic bid submission, to do your online and electronic bid submission through the GPPB portal. But this is this GPPB portal is currently still being uh, developed. Okay. So if you don't have that capability, then it's okay. You do it through the traditional way. But if you have, then there is this option for you, you know, to do it uh, electronically. Next slide. So if you think, if your agency has the capability to accept online and electronic submission of bids, then you have to do this certification. This certification using this format. And this is a one-time requirement. The agency should certify that they are doing the online and electronic submission of bids and they comply with these requirements because there are technical requirements for you to do the online and electronic submission of bids. So it is issued by the highest official managing the IT system of the agency. They, they, they would have to describe the procedure and the system to be used for the electronic submission and receipt of bids and compliant with the requirements under GPPB 9-2020. Because GPPB 9-2020, resolution number 9-2020 tells you the, the basic requirements. But all your all these requirements must be present in your feature, in the features of your online and electronic submission feeds. Okay. And if you have that, then you have the certification, you submit it through this uh, email address to the GPPB TSO. So this is required under GPPB resolution number 12-2020. Okay. Again, as I said, if, if, if your agency is not capable of doing this, then you go by the traditional way, no? uh, the, the traditional two envelope uh, month physical envelope system. Next slide. So after the pre-procurement conference, when you have determined that you are now ready to undertake the procurement, then we go to the first step, which is to advertise. Yeah, but this is important. This is an important and crucial step because the advertisement or posting of the invitation to bid starts, signals the start of the procurement process, the start of the bidding process. Okay. Remember the, the number of days we mentioned a while ago? Yeah, but this is the shortest number of days and the longest number of days to finish the procurement. It all starts with the count, the, the, the counting of the number of days starts here. No, when you actually advertise or post the invitation to bid or request uh, for expression of interest in the uh, in the in, in these uh, different ways no? in the field jobs, in the agency's website and in the bulletin board of the agency seven days continuously okay so this is a critical step if you're not yet ready to do the procurement then don't advertise because as i said the number the counting of the number of days the minimum and the maximum starts from the the invitation to bid so where should it be advertised uh, in the field jobs website, in the agency's website, and also in the bulletin board uh, of the agency. Next slide. 
in 9184, uh, the, in the 2016 IRR, it says that advertisement of bid opportunities in newspaper shall no longer require two years after the effectivity of the 2016 IRR. So two years from the 2016, that would be October 28, 2018 onwards. That is GPPB resolution number 22-2018. So 2018, October 28 onwards, no need for a newspaper publication. Okay, next slide. So once you advertise, the first step for the bidders from the bidder side, if they see that the, the bid, uh, the invitation to bid, sorry, was already advertised, the first thing that they have to do is to get a copy of the bidding documents. And how do they get it? I could they get it from the, web, the, the agency itself, or they could download it from FieldJets or download it from the agency's website. And they would have to pay for it no? later on, either pay for it immediately or pay for it later on. And the bidding docs fee, the bid docs fee, okay? Uh, the bid docs fee uh, has a standard cost. Uh, it's here in the screen how much the cost of the bid docs will be. And the amount of the bid docs fee will depend upon the ABC. So depending on the value of the ABC. The bid docs fee may be refunded if uh, the project or the procurement is canceled on the grounds in section 41. So if the reason for the cancellation of the bid is found in uh, uh, section 41, the reservation clause of Meti 184, then uh, you can have the, the, the bid documents be refunded. Next slide. So eligibility and shortlisting. Remember in consulting, there is an extra step, which is the short eligibility check and shortlisting. So a prospective bidder should submit its expression of interest together with the required eligibility documents on or before the date of submission, date and time for the submission of such requirement. The next slide. So shortlisting, eligibility check and shortlisting. So again, this is found in consulting. Shortlisting is the process to the, of determining the most qualified consultant for those that submitted the eligibility requirements. Okay, so in shortlisting stage, you submit just the eligibility requirements. Palang. Then you'll be shortlisting. Then later on, in the actual bid, that's the time you submit the technical requirements. Okay, so you want to shortlist first who are eligible. So only those who are eligible will be allowed to participate. So the shortlist shall consist of three to seven consultants with five as the most preferable number. Shortlisted consultants should be invited to participate in the bidding for this project through a notice of eligibility and shortlisting issued by the bank. So only those who receive this uh, notice of eligibility or end shortlisting shall be allowed to submit, you know, participate, attending the pre-bid and submit the, the technical documents. Next slide. Next slide. So how do we do the shortlisting? So these are the recommended the weights and the, the, the criteria and the recommended weights. No? So of applicable experience of the consultant, overall experience uh, of the firm, individual experience of the principal and key staff, time when employed by the other consultants, and then qualification of personnel, 50%. Okay? And then qualification of personnel to be assigned uh, to the job and the extent and complexity of the undertaking, 30%. And then current workload relative to the job capacity, 20%. Okay. So these are the criteria to be used you know, for the shortlisting. Next slide. So the back ranks the prospective consultants that meet the passing score from highest to lowest to determine the shortlisted consultant. Remember a while ago we said three, five, or seven. Now with five as the ideal number of shortlisted consultants. The back recommends the, the shortlist of the hoop for consideration and approval. And only the shortlisted consultant can submit the proposal. Okay. So that's the extra step for consulting services. Next slide. Eligibility requirement for foreign bidders. So for foreign bidders, uh, class A documents, these are the, the legal, technical, and financial documents. Uh, it must be in English. It must not have, if not, there must be a translation in English by any of the following. 
to the relevant gov foreign government agency, the foreign government agency authorized to translate documents, or a registered translator in the foreign leader's country. The document should be authenticated by the appropriate Philippine Foreign Service Establishment Post or equivalent office having jurisdiction over the foreign bidder's affairs in the Philippines. So the idea, the whole point lang is, if there's a foreign bidder, it must be, in their submitting their documents, it must be translated into English. Okay? It must be in English or it must be translated uh, into English. Next slide. So the apostille, this is a new feature, no? And this also makes it easier uh, for foreign leaders uh, to participate. So the apostille, the objective of the apostille is to shorten the process of authenticating documents of foreign leaders who intend to participate in government procurement in the Philippines. Diba? Because the Philippines already acceded to the Hague Convention of 1961, abolishing the requirement of legalization of foreign public documents. So this was just effective no, quite recent, no, uh, May 14, 2019. So the for Philippine Foreign Service Establishment will, no, will now authenticate documents through an apostille. And these documents are strictly for use of public document support. So it is done through an apostille. It makes it easier. So for contracting parties to the apostille convention, the document shall be authenticated through an apostille by the competent authority. Except for countries identified by the BFA that shall require legalization by relevant, no? yung, mga, yung old style, yung meron, meron pang red ribbon. That's the old style. You have to get the red ribbon pa from, from the BFA. But with the apostille, it makes it easier. So next slide. So after the advertisement, okay, after the advertisement, and then you've already gotten the bid documents, you've already paid for the bid documents, for instance, you've read the bid documents, the next step is for you to attend the pre-bid conference. Attend the pre-bid conference. What is the purpose? Why would, why would you want to attend the pre-bid conference? Or why do you, from the procurement side, why do you want to conduct the, uh, the pre-bid conference? The purpose of the pre-bid conference is to discuss, clarify, and explain what? What do you explain? The eligibility requirement and the technical and financial component of the contract to be bid, including questions and clarifications raised by the prospective bidders before and during the pre-bid conference. So it is a forum no, wherein the bidders can talk to, the, can meet with the back. Diba? and discuss the, the eligibility requirement and technical and, and financial components of the, of the contract. Diba? There might be clarification, there might be vague provisions, diba? there might be technical specifications which are vague, uh, scope of work and all that. They want to discuss with, with the back to, to clarify so there, that there will be no misunderstanding, especially when they're already uh, preparing the bid. So this must be done at least 12 calendar days before the submission of the bid, but not earlier than seven calendar days from the posting. So the at least 12 calendar days before the deadline, you have to conduct the pre-bid conference so that the, the bidders will have an opportunity to clarify diba? and make sure that everyone's question uh, is answered before they actually sit down and uh, prepare the bid to be submitted. Next slide. So pre-bid conference, measures to maximize pre-bid conference. The back shall have a proactive role during the pre-bid conference. Kasi sometimes yung mga bidders, wala namang question or naiiyang magtanong or talagang walang tanong because it's a very routinary ano, that they already understand. But it doesn't mean that you just conclude the pre-bid conference without doing anything. Diba? So the back shall have a proactive role. In GPPB Resolution 2-18, it tells you what are the things that you could discuss what are the things that you could discuss during the pre -bid conference? Next slide. So what are the things that you can discuss during the pre -bid conference? Usually you can use the pre -bid conference to give pointers, to give reminders, to give pointers and reminders to the bidders that, okay, these are the, this is how you have to seal your envelopes. Do not forget to seal it. This is how you label it. These are the common mistakes of the bidders. Diba? You remind them. Diba? You educate them. Now, these are the common mistakes. Make sure you don't commit these errors. Diba? We want to remind you that this is the deadline. This is how you have to submit it. Don't be late and all that. So it's, it's more an idea, especially for first-time bidders. You want to give them tips and pointers of how to 
to prepare the bid and make sure they, they, they don't commit the common mistakes and all that. Okay, it's in, in that uh, GPPB resolution, what are the things that you have to discuss during the pre-bid conference? Now, uh, a, new, a new rule here in GPPB resolution number 4-2021, minutes of the pre-bid conference shall no longer be posted in the uh, website, okay? No need to be posting the minutes of the pre-bid conference in the website. Next slide. So bid bulletin. So after the pre-bid conference, then there might be questions, but there might be clarifications, and it must be given to the bidders. The response to the questions and the clarifications uh, should be given in writing. Okay, issued by the BAC, duly signed by the uh, BAC chairperson to answer questions for clarification or interpretation, clarify or modify, they modify any provision of the bidding documents. So these are all embodied in the bid bulletin. It, it is in writing, not just oral. So we rely on what is in the bid bulletin, especially when we're talking about a modification of the uh, modification of the provisions in the bidding documents. So it must be issued seven days before the deadline of submission of the bids. Queries must be made before. Queries should be submitted to the back 10 days before the deadline of bid submission. So if you're a bidder and you want to submit queries, you must submit it 10 days before the bid submission for it to be entertained. And bid bulletins must be released seven days before the deadline of the bid submission. Okay, so if you're a bidder, of course, you want to be, uh, no, be updated and make sure you get all the copies of the bid bulletin because it might have, it might have modified the bidding documents. Next slide. So next step is the, so after you have uh, attended the bid, the, the pre-bid conference, the next step is to for you to submit the bid, prepare and submit the bid. So how do you submit the bid? So you have the eligibility documents and the technical doc requirements, but elig eligibility documents, the technical and financial uh, eligibility documents, and then the technical requirements we'll discuss later in the first envelope. And then, your second, your, your, your financial proposal to put inside that, to be placed inside the second envelope. And the first envelope, the second envelope must be put together inside the, the bid envelope together. And then there is the bid validity. How, val how long is your bid valid? 120 days from the date of the opening of the bid. So the prices and other terms must be valid for 120 calendar days from the opening of the bids. Next slide. So how about electronic? If it is done in the electronic, okay? I mentioned this, we mentioned this a while ago. GPPB resolution number 9-2020. What are the requirements? I said, I mentioned a while ago, may mga requirements ang electronic or online or electronic submission of bids. If your agency has this capability, has this infrastructure to, to, to receive electronic and online submission of bids, then you can do it through this way. What are the requirements? It has, it has three basic requirements. Your system must have the two-factor security procedure, archive and password protected. Okay, two-factor two security procedure. Number two, it allows access to a pass, password protected bidding documents. Password shall be disclosed by the bidders only during the actual bidding uh, bid opening. And number three, it must be capable of generating an audit trail of transaction. Okay, maybe once the bidder submits, it is able to generate an email. If an email is sent to the, to the bidder saying we've accepted, we've received your bid, tapos may time and date on. Yung mga ganon. So there are these features. Diba? Hindi lang siya basta electronic. There are features. Your system must, and then, and then a while ago, diba, we mentioned the, the agency must issue a certification that they comply with these basic requirements and they're doing it. And also you must indicate in your invitation to bid and the bidding documents that you're, you're allowing electronic and online submission of bids. And again, as I said, if you, you cannot comply with this, then you go to the traditional manual method of bid submission. Okay. Next slide. So again, bid submitted electronically. So ganun din siya. So except that it's electronic. So you have the envelope one and envelope two, diba? the technical and the financial, and then the bid envelope. Pass submitted pa bids must be encrypted and password protected. Next slide. 
sealing and marking of bids. So how do we seal and mark the bids? We mentioned a while ago, we have the uh, envelope one. Envelope one, the yeah, envelope one, the original uh, technical, okay. Original technical, uh, original technical, and then the, the legal, technical, and financial requirement, and then the original financial, okay, the, the, the bid, no? your financial bid, and then you put there in the one envelope. Each envelope shall contain the name and the contract to be bid, the num name, the, the name and address of the bidder, the recipient back, or career entity, and the words do not open before this date. The date of the opening of the bids. So it may label, no, each envelope should be labeled like this. Next slide. So in case the agency requires you to give a copy, extra copy. So if you have a copy, then the copy. The copy one of the legal financial technical and then copy two of the copy two of the financial bid and then the, the copy. So meaning there's one envelope na original and then one envelope na uh, copy, uh, photocopy of the of the bid. Each envelope again contain the isa naman original. Okay, next slide. So you'll see here, no? So there's the original version and the photocopy version. The so original and the photocopy version is put together in one bid envelope. So each bid shall contest. So when you open the bid envelope, there's two envelopes inside. And when you open each of the envelopes, there's another two envelopes inside. So ganun siya. So the copy envelope, or, or depends on how many copies uh, the agency requires. No? So it could be just one copy or more than one. So each envelope shall contain the name of the contract to be bid, the name and address of the bidder, the recipient back, and the, the words do not open before this date. Okay. So next slide. So this issue of unsealed and unmarked. Okay. So if it's unsealed and unmarked, then it is disqualified. Okay. Or if it's electronic, not compressed and password protected, then it's disqualified. Okay. Versus if it's improperly sealed and marked. So there's a seal. There's mark, but it's improper. Maybe one or two words were missing or it's not properly sealed. If a part of it is open, walang tape or what, then it's still allowed. Still must be accepted. Okay, so you make the distinction. Iba yung unsealed and unmarked, iba yung improperly sealed and improperly marked. Ganun din sa electronic, improperly compressed and password protected. Okay, still acceptable. Yung isa is unacceptable. Next slide. All right, thank you, Pusher. Uh, for our uh, second knowledge check question, please drop your answers through the Zoom chat box this time because we will again be giving a special token to the first participant who shall correctly answer this particular question. So the question is, improperly sealed and improperly marked bid envelopes shall be accepted provided that the bidder or its duly authorized representative shall acknowledge such condition of the bid as submitted. Is this true or false? All right, sir. Um, from what is registered in my Zoom chat box, for the first participant to answer is from LGU Cabarogis Querino, and he answers. He answered true. Is this correct, po? Mahakatanga po ba siya ng ating special token? Yes, no, it is correct. The answer is true. Improperly sealed 
diba? the previous slide just shows you improperly sealed and marked envelopes are acceptable. Provided, I just forgot to mention, provided the bidder or at least duly authorized representative acknowledge uh, such uh, condition. Okay? Kasi was a problem with improperly sealed and improperly marked. Kasi baka mamaya, merong nawala. Diba? Kasi it's improperly sealed. So maybe it's, it's open or partially sealed na may nahugot or something na missing inside. So when you see the envelope, it's improperly sealed. We cannot reject it kasi the rose we accept. Pero kailangan i-certify ng representative na, oh, it's really improperly marked and improperly sealed. Diba? Kasi later on, when you open it, tapos may nawawalang papel ka sa loob, then ano yun? Risk ni bidder yun. Kasi hindi niya ni-seal properly. Kasi the other option will be, if it's unmarked and unsealed, then we disqualify. We don't even, diba? we don't even consider it kasi disqualified na siya. Ibabalik din sa kanya yun. Pero improperly sealed, we will accept, provided you certify na improperly sealed siya. So just in case may mawawala later on, pag binuksan natin talaga siya, hindi kasalanan ni Bak yun. Diba? Kasalanan ni Bidder yun kasi hindi niya sinara ng mabuti, may pinawala, nahulog or nalaglag yung, yung laman sa loob. So that's the answer. Alright, thank you very much, attorney. And congratulations po once again to Sir Marcos Salvador Agustin from LGU Cabarogis Querino. Kindly peep po, sir, into your chat box or to your email for the coordination of uh, on how you can claim your uh, special token. So we may now proceed po to our lecture proper. So let's continue. So we're now in the step of submission and receipt of bids. So tapos na, nasil mo na siya ng mabuti na isubmit mo na siya doon sa sa procuring entity. So when do you have to submit under the rules? Date of submission should not be later than the following period from the last day of posting. So may may ano rin. The rules also provide when is the date that you have to peg to set maximum, 'di ba? From the time of the last day, take note the last day again, 'di ba? I mentioned a while ago, the advertisement signals the start of the procuring process. So dun, yung, yung, yung advertisement, dun, dun nag-uumpisa yung pagtakbo ng metro. Di ba yung pagka-count ng lahat-lahat ng mga numbers of days na ito? So very critical yung pag, pag, pag ano ng advertisement. Okay? Kasi dun nga yung pagbibilang ng metro. So for instance, for goods, 45 days. The date of submission should not be later than 45 days after the last day of posting of the invitation to be. So beyond that, magkakaproblema ka na. No? Mag-call out ka na ng bidder, mag-call out ka na ng COA and all that. No? Why hindi ka pa nagpapa-open or nagpapasubmit? Okay, so 45 days. Uh, infra, uh, ito yung, yung difference sa infra, pwede 50 or 65, depending. So if it's 50 million and below, then 50 days. Uh, 50 million and above, then 65 days. You want to give the bidders kasi time to prepare the bid. So you're giving, in effect, what this means is the bidder has 45 days. Diba? Maximum. It could be shorter. But the maximum is 45 days. Uh, 45 days. Now you're bidding, giving the, the bidder maximum of 45 days or 50 days or 65 days or 75 days to prepare the bid. Kasi pag, you say, 50 million and above, it's very complicated uh, type of infra project. Then they will have need to, to, to have more time to study and to prepare and get documents. So for bids, uh, bids submitted electronically, The procuring entity shall generate a bid receipt page for the official time of submission, which can be saved or printed by the bidder upon receipt of the first and second envelope. So again, we mentioned a while ago, but this is one of the important capability or features of online and electronic submission of bids. Dapat makakapag-generate ka ng uh, paper trail, ng audit trail, ng bid receipt page. So pagka-click ng submit, dapat may email na matatanggap si bidder or something, text or whatever, na nagsasabing nagpapatunay na natanggap yung bid. Okay. So yun. That's GPPB Resolution number 9-2020. Kung hindi nga kaya, then you go the manual way. Okay, next slide. So how about modification and withdrawal? So under the rules, you can modify. You submit the bid and then you, you change your mind. You want to change your bid. Okay lang. You modify it. Diba? Of course, you can modify it only before the deadline. Diba? If you submit your bid during the deadline, then you cannot modify anymore. You can only withdraw. For bid submitted before the deadline, you can modify or withdraw. For bid submitted on the deadline, then just withdraw the option. Okay? So modify. So you want to modify it, then you can modify it. You can change it. If you forgot, for instance, if you forgot to put it in the mayor's permit or what, then you can modify it. Submit a modified bid. 
So the, the, the bidder submits a new bid equally sealed, properly identified, linked to its original bid and mark modification. Okay, let's say nakalimutan mo nga, may, naka, may naalala kang may nakalimutan kang ilagay. Withdraw, how about withdraw? You just decide na ayaw mo nang sumali for some reason. Diba? You feel that, you know, hindi ka na, well, you feel that the price is not ano, anymore, you don't want to join anymore, then you withdraw. Letter of withdrawal must be received prior to the deadline for submission and receipt of bids. For bids withdrawn, Within the interval between the deadline and expiration of the bid validity, the bid security shall be forfeited. Okay. So yeah, you will fit your forfeit your bid security when you withdraw after the deadline and before the expiration of the bid validity. For electronic bid submission, the bidder shall send another bid. So ganun rin, pag, pag electronic bid submission, you can also modify or you can also withdraw. Okay. that must have that capability na makapag-modify siya. So for electronic bid submission, bidders shall send another bid equally secured, properly identified, and labeled modification of one of the previously of the one previously submitted. The time indicated in the latest bid receipt page generated shall be the official time of submission. Siyempre, when you submit it again, mag-generate siya ulit ng, ng notice, ng alert, di ba, na nag-submit ka, then that will be your uh, official uh, date and time of submission. Next slide. So now we go to the opening. So nakapag-submit ka na ng two envelopes. Now it is the turn of the back to open the envelope. So the back shall open the bid in public immediately after the deadline for the submission and receipt of bids. So normally, we set the deadline for the opening at the same day. Uh, we set the opening at the same day as the deadline. So if the deadline is, let's say, September 8th, 9 o'clock, we usually set the opening also September 8th, about 9 plus, about 9 o'clock then. Okay, so you open the first envelope. Open the first envelope. So presence or absence, we have a checklist diba, to check the documents in the first envelope. So there is a checklist of required documents and using a non-discretionary pass-fill criterion, we go through it and, and see. No, if it's there, then good. If it's not, then disqualified. Okay, if you forgot to put the bid security, or forgot to put the GIS, uh, Articles of Incorporation, then you will be disqualified. And then second envelope, open the second envelope of bidders whose first envelope was rated passed. So we first open all the first envelope and those who pass the first envelope, we open their second envelope. Okay, And then only those bidders whose first and second envelope were rated passed will be ranked as red. Okay, but then will be ranked. They will be ranked depending on the amount of bid they put in the second envelope. Next slide. If it's electronic submission, password shall be disclosed by the bidders only during the actual bid opening. So only the bidders know the password and even and then they will open the, the parang pag open rin ang envelope, but except that the password bid, bid will, will be the one to be used to open the, the envelope. Next slide. So you open the bids. In case the submitted bids cannot be opened as scheduled due, due to justifiable reasons, then the back shall take custody of said bids and reschedule the opening on the next working day or at the soonest possible time. They post in the field just website and the website of the, of the procuring entity concerned. So notice of postponement. Let's say for some reason, nagkaroon ng bagyo or something, they're not able to open it, then they will keep the envelopes in the vault but they will save, keep it in the boat, in the in the boat, yeah, and then keep it there, and then tell you when they're gonna open it. Maybe tomorrow, the next day, okay, yeah. And then that's the time. Then you then you know. Then you can go and witness the the opening of the envelopes. Next slide. So open the first envelope. So opening and evaluation the first envelope. So what is inside the first envelope? So the eligibility requirements, the technical requirements. So we have the class A documents, the legal, technical, and financial documents. Class B, in case it's a joint venture, okay, the joint venture agreement. Okay. And then the technical components, the bid security, the project requirement, and the omnibus warrant statement. So this is the eligibility requirements, the legal, technical, and financial documents. Technical requirements. This this is the bid security project requirement and omnibus run statement. This is found in the 
first envelope, technical component. Next slide. Next, eligibility requirements. So we go into the details. No? So class A documents, either you have a field JEPS class certificate of registration, platinum membership, or if you don't have that, then you have to give these this documents, uh, class A legal documents, uh, SEC registration, mayor's permit, tax clearance, audited financial statement, okay? And then class A technical documents is the statement of all ongoing contracts, statement of the single largest and completed contract, pickup license, or special pickup license for JD, and statement of the consultant of its specifying its nationality for, consul for uh, consulting services. And then the financial documents, uh, legal, technical, and financial. So sa financial naman niya, is the NFCC computation. And in class B, class B naman is the JV uh, agreement to enter into a JV, not a JV, agreement uh, to enter. Uh, uh, in case of joint venture agreement, the JV agreement entered into by the, by the parties. Okay. So this is the eligibility document. So we go down to the details. In legal elig eligibility requirement, class A, so pag mayor's permit under the rules, uh, recently expired mayor's permit shall be permitted, shall be accepted together with the OR, okay, together with the official receipt. And then the renewed permit shall be submitted as a post qual requirement in accordance with section 34.2. So pwede ang expired mayor's permit. Okay, OR meaning you've already applied for the new mayor's permit. Pero hindi pa lumalabas yung new mayor's permit. And then the new mayor's permit should be presented as shown who is subjected to what you submitted during post squad as a post squad report. Next slide. Tax clearance. Iba ang rule pagdating sa tax clearance. Diba? Pag mayor's permit, pwede ang expired. How about pag tax clearance? Submission of BIR receipt for renewal of tax clearance shall not supplies in lieu of the tax clearance requirement. So, hindi pwede ang expired tax clearance. Submission of a provisional provisionary tax clearance issued by the marketing purposes is not acceptable form of tax clearance. So, for tax clearance, the rule is not the same. It must be a valid tax clearance. So technical eligibility requirement, statement of all ongoing government and private contract. So statement of all, all ongoing government and private contract, including contracts awarded but not yet started. If any, whether similar or not similar in nature and complexity to the contract, the statement shall include all information required in the bidding document. So if you just state, state the all ongoing contracts, ano yung supporting, ano mo, should be those required in the bidding document. The statement shall include all information. The information, you must disclose the information required in the bidding documents. The bidding documents will tell you, ano yung mga information related to this all ongoing contracts ang kailangan mong ilagay. Those a statement of all ongoing government and private contracts. Next slide. So SLCC. So how does it work? The as the single largest completed contract. As a general rule, for for goods, no, uh, expand services and expandable non-expandable supply fifty percent of the ABC. Uh, expandable supply is twenty five percent. Exception: this requirement. There is an exception. If at the outset, after the market research, applying the general rule will likely result to failure of bidding or monopoly, then, pwede mong irelax itong requirement na to by requiring that at least two similar contracts, the aggregate amount of at least equal to the required percentage and the largest of the similar contract amounts of 50% of the required percentage. We'll, we'll illustrate this in the next slide. The next slide. So this is how do you do the SLCC. Okay, so let's say goods. And then it's expandable, expendable. So under the rules, if it's expendable, ang requirement ng SLCC is 25% of the ABC. 
Pag non-expendable, 50% of the ABC. Okay? So kung ang ABC mo 1 million per instance, then you must be able to show an SLCC of at least 250,000. Diba? For expendable. And for non-expendable, at least 500,000. So dapat yung SLCC na i-present mo is at least worth 250,000 or 500,000. Now, let's say mahirap gawin yun or it will uh, it will result nga in a while ago on a failure of bidding for instance if for some reason mahirap gawin yun then you could relax the requirement you could say that the aggregate amount of at least two similar contracts so instead of just one contract worth 250 pwede ka mag present ang dalawang contract diba dalawang contract and then the largest which is at least the, the total of the two should be at least equal to 250 Pero the larger of the one, let's say in this example, na ang pinakita niya is isang 100, isang 200. So technically, hindi siya compliant kasi ang requirement natin is 250. Eh. Pero yung pinakita is 100, 200. So allowed yun because of the exception. You must be able to present two. The aggregate of these two is 300,000. So pasok siya because it's above the, uh, it's at least equivalent to, diba? at least equivalent to 250,000. And the largest, the 200,000 is at least 50% of the required percentage. 50% of 250 is 125,000. So your large, your largest is 200 is above the 125,000. So ganun yun. Similar here, di ba? So the aggregate of these two, 300,000 and 400,000 is 700,000, which is already above the 500. But independently, yung isang 300, yung isang 400, kulang pa siya to meet the 500. But kung dalawa, then it's enough to meet the 500. And the larger one, diba? the larger one, the 400,000 is at least 50% of that 500. 50% of 500 is 250. So the larger one, 400, is, uh, is at least 50% of the required percentage. Okay. So this is how it works. Next slide. That is for goods. No? For infra, for infra, it is the SLCC completed should be similar to the contract to be bid. And the SLCC should at least 50% of the ABC. Okay, 50% of the ABC. Kanina for goods, it's at 50% uh, or 25% of the ABC, depending on expandable or non-expandable. But for infra, it's 50% of the ABC. Upon adjustment to current prices using the PSA, uh, Consumer Price Index. Contractors under small A and small B categories without similar experience on the contract may participate if the cost of the contract to be bid is not more than the ARCC of their registration. So yun. this is the another requirement. Uh, if you do not have the similar experience on the contract to, 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 to be bid, so long as your the cost of the contract is not more than your ARCC. Okay. So next slide. The pickup license, the requirement for pickup license as a technical eligibility requirement. So pickup license, it must be valid pickup license or a special pickup license for JB. Registration for the type and cost of the contract to be bid should be valid at the time of the deadline for the submission and, on, uh, and opening of the bids. So it must be a valid and, and non-expired uh, pickup license. Next slide. So, as I said, it must be valid and non-expired because a temporary pickup license diba, cannot be allowed. So, pickup license, license issued by the pickup, allow, allowing an entity to engage in business as a contractor. Turnaround time for the issuance of a pickup license, usually 20, 20 calendar days. So, a temporary pickup license uh, is not allowed, no? but have not yet been processed due to high volume of applicants. Under GPPB resolution 10 2019, no, temporary pickup license is not acceptable. Next slide. So, financial, the financial document, audited financial statement. So, showing among others the bidder's total current asset and current, current asset and liabilities, it's stamp received by the BAR. Okay. Audited financial statement for the preceding calendar year, which should not be earlier than two years from date of the bid submission. Next slide.
and FCC for goods and infrastructure projects. How do you compute the NFCC? The NFCC should be at least equal to the ABC. The NFCC should be equal to the ABC. And this is the formula to compute the NFCC. So current asset minus current liability. Okay. So the idea of NFCC is that you want the, the bidder to have the financial capacity to finish the project. Ayaw natin na in-award natin sa kanya tapos biglang in the middle na bankrupt siya. Diba? Hindi na niya kayang tapusin yung project. Then, then the project will be uncompleted. Diba? It will be abandoned in the middle of the project because naubusan ng funds or ng budget or ng yeah, finances yung, yung, yung bidder. So we want to see at the onset if based on the the financial capacity of the bidder, kaya ba niyang tapusin? Kaya we want an NFCC equivalent to the ABC, which is the value of the contract. So how do you compute? Yung, yung current asset ng, ng bidder, di ba? minus yung liability niya. And then what happens? You multiply by the K, the K factor, which is 15. Okay? And then minus all the outstanding, yung mga commitments niya. Yung by asset, then minus liability. And then ma-minus mo yung sa mga outstanding and uncompleted portions of projects under ongoing contract, including contract awarded uh, but yet to be started, coinciding with the contract to be bid. Okay. So we want the NFCC, yung, kabu, yung, yung total nito, should be at least equal to the ABC so that we are somehow assured na kaya tapusin yung project, which is equivalent to the ABC cost. Diba? For infra, that's for infra. For goods, meron kang option. Either you compute the NFCC or you get a credit line certificate from a bank, a universal bank. So may option ka sa goods. Let's say hindi umabot yung NFCC mo. Pwede meron kang parang bank guarantee siya na you can get the money from the bank. No? Credit line certificate from a bank. Next slide. Class B documents for joint venture. So there must be a valid joint venture agreement. And pag joint venture, let's say dalawa sila, right? So pag dalawa sila, pagdating sa legal eligibility requirements, kailangan lahat ng mga parties mag-submit ng legal documents, ng your permit, yung mga ganon. Pero for the technical eligibility and the financial eligibility, only any of the partners diba, may submit, not both. No need, to, no, no need for both partners to submit. Only one of them or any of them, kung tatlo or apat sila, any of them, uh, any of them may submit the technical and financial. Pero pagdating sa legal, all of them must submit the legal eligibility requirements. A while ago, we already enumerated ano, si, uh, ano yung legal, ano yung technical, and ano yung, ano yung financial. Okay. So, joint submission. Next slide. Project requirements, goods and services. Conformity with the schedule of requirements. Conformity with the technical specification. Next slide. Project requirements, pagdating sa infra, organizational. This is in the, the, ba, in, the in, in the first envelope, merong technical, uh, technical component, the ba, technical component of the envelope. Uh, so this is the technical component. Uh, organizational chart for the contract to be bid, list of contractors, key personnel, and list of contracts, major equipment needs. Next slide. So ito laman ng technical component. And then for consulting, iba pa yung technical, ano niya, technical requirements niya. So technical proposal submission form, bid security, consultants references, comments and suggestions of consultant uh, on the TOR, methodology and work plan, team composition and task, CV for proposed professional staff. Diba? So ito yung mga forms. Uh, time schedule for professional, personnel, activity work schedule, and then omnibus sworn statement. So ito yung laman, yung technical requirement. Diba? Eligibility requirement and then technical requirement. So eligibility requirement, medical, technical, and financial. Tapos dito sa technical requirement, yung kanina. So for goods, for infra, and for consulting. Next. The, the bid security. 
The bid security is a guarantee that the successful bidder shall, within 10 days from receipt of the notice of award, enter into the contract with the procuring entity and furnish the performance security required. Okay. So the, the bid security is basically a guarantee that you will not back out. Diba? Pag ikaw yung na-declare na winning bidder, hindi ka mag-back out. Kasi pag nag-back out ka, then ma-for-profit yung bid security. Right? So there are three forms. No, It could be either cash or, or manager's check or bank guarantee, okay? letter of credit from the bank, it's 2% of the ABC. Or you could have a surety bond, which is 5% of the ABC. Or the more simpler one is a bid securing declaration. You just sign a bid securing declaration and that will be your bid security. Excuse me, next slide. So ito, bid securing declaration. So how does a bid securing declaration look like? You make sure that you copy the proper way of making the bid securing declaration. Uh, revise a document undertaking, undertaking or undertaking signed by the bidder committing to pay the corresponding fine and be automatically disqualified from bidding of any procurement contract of a PE for a period of time upon receipt of the blacklisting order in the event it violated any of the conditions stated therein. This, this is a new provision that you include in the bid securing declaration that you will be automatically disqualified if there is a violation. And then the penalties, how do you compute the penalties? Penalty of disqualification for two years from bidding for any procurement contract with any PE upon receipt of the uh, blacklisting order. Payment of fine to be calculated in accordance with the rule set. Okay, so this is the new provision that you must include in the, in the, in the bid securing declaration. Next slide. Omnibus sworn statement. So again, the omnibus sworn statement, there is a template for it. So make sure you copy or prepare, you, you comply with the template in the omnibus sworn statement. So there's a new provisions here. So these are the, the other things here in the screen is the old provisions of what should be included in the uh, omnibus sworn statement. You must say that you're not included in the blacklist, for instance, or Itong bago, in case of advance payment was made or given, failure to perform or deliver any of the obligations and undertaking in the contract should be sufficient ground to constitute criminal liability. Okay, so you put it there. So the, the procuring entity could later on sue you criminally if you did not perform. Uh, and then you receive the advance payment. So this is GPPB Resolution 16-2020. Next slide. So for electronic and uh, online submission of bids, a scanned copy of the first envelope with the required form shall be considered as compliant with the requirement of the bid, secure, bid, bid submission. So scan copy. Okay. Uh, subject to the submission of the original copies of the following during post qualification. So bid security or bid securing declaration, omnibus one statement, you have to submit the original copy uh, upon post qual. Non-submission of this form shall be ground for post-disqualification. So this is in cases of electronic or online submission of bids. Next slide. All right. Thank you, Paul, for our third knowledge check question. Can the answer in the pop a poll that shall be flashed in our screens. Gising pa po kaya ang ating mga participants, attorney. So then now, uh, for our third question, Procuring entities cannot add another requirement to nor delete any requirement from the identified list of eligibility requirements. Is this true or false? Also, Pono, we would like to greet our uh, Facebook Live viewers a very good Wednesday morning, and we hope we are all all safe and dry. You may also join for our knowledge check questions by dropping your answers in the comment section. For our Zoom participants, for those who are having a hard time answering our knowledge check questions through the Zoom polling feature, please let us know po so that we may assist you accordingly. Ayan, attorney, I, I think we uh, have reached the majority po. The majority of our particip participants answered true. Is this uh, correct, Paul? 
Yes, no, it is correct. The answer is true. Uh, procuring entities cannot add another requirement nor delete any requirements from the identified list of eligibility requirement. We discussed a while ago that legal, technical, and financial eligibility requirement. You cannot add or uh, know that. That's for purposes of standardization. So every all the procuring entities must have a standard list para hindi rin nalilito yung mga bidders. No? So if you bid anywhere, any agency, even in the barangay level, it is the same. Diba? If you want to add additional requirements or what, you can put it in the in the technical eligibility or you can put it in the post-call requirement. Diba? You can put it there. If you really want that thing to be there, then you put it in the uh, as part of the technical uh, eligibility or in the post-call requirement, but not here in the uh, eligibility requirement. Thank you, Attorney. We will now proceed po to the lecture proper. Okay. Alternative documentary requirements during a state of calamity or restrictions. GPPB Resolution Number 9-2020. So in view of the COVID situation, uh, the GPPB uh, promulgated some rules no, to, to be more flexible given the situation. The context kasi of this one was at the time there was a strict lockdown and no one can go out of the, the house or the offices are closed diba, during 2020. So uh, because of that context, uh, this, were, this was issued. PE shall accept alternate documentary requirements for procurement activities during a state of calamity or implementation of community quarantine or similar restrictions declared, which exceeds shall be determined and validated by the BAC. Okay, so these are the revisions. Number one, a notarized bid securing declaration. So at the time, there was no notary available. So a notarized bid securing declaration are allowed. Expired mayor's permit with OR, uh, with official receipt of renewal, renewal application, subject to submission of the business or mayor's permit after the award contract, but before payment. Diba? Under the, the rule, kasi it is submission of the actual uh, receipt during post-qual. But ito, pwede na yung even after the award, but before the payment. Okay. Omnibus sworn statement subject to compliance. Their their unnotarized omnibus sworn statement. The unnotarized omnibus sworn statement subject to compliance with after the award but before uh, the payment. Okay. So ito yung mga bagong ano bagong uh, bagong mga revisions because of uh, you know, the the uh, state of calamity or quarantine restrictions. Next slide. So now we open the second envelope. Okay, we of course opened the first envelope already. We see everything there. Then we go to the second envelope for goods and services. The second envelope, may format din yung second envelope. Di lang siya basta price. So there is the bid form, the applicable price schedule, certification from DTI if the bidder is claiming preference as a domestic bidder. Next slide. The financial component for infra. So the financial bid form, the BOQ, bid price in the bill of quantities, detailed estimates, cash flow by quarter. So it's quite complicated ano rin, no? in, in the second envelope. It, not, it is not just putting your price there, putting your bid there. Next slide. For consulting services, the second envelope, there is the uh, financial proposal submission form, Summary of cost, breakdown of price per activity, breakdown of remuneration, okay, and reimbursables. And then miscellaneous expenses. So this is found in the second envelope. Next slide. So now we go to the detailed evaluation of the bids. It should be completed within seven days from deadline of receipt of proposals. So what is the purpose of the detailed evaluation of bids? To determine the LCB, lowest calculated bid or the highest rated bid by establishing correct calculated price of bids and ranking the calculated total bid price from lowest to highest. So how do you do the detailed evaluation of bids? Non-discretionary criteria should be used. We shall con consist of, we shall include consideration of completeness of the bid and minor arithmetic errors. The result shall be contained in the abstract of the bids. So a while ago, we went through the ano lang, we went through the the ano, 
we went through the documents inside the envelopes using a non-discretionary pass-fail criterion, presence or absence lang. Diba? Presence or absence lang. But now, uh, we go into detail. We check the computation, we check the completeness, everything. Right? We go back and, yeah, it says your completeness of the bits. Diba? We might have missed out during the preliminary, ano, baka may, may, may miss out tayo now when you look up, kulang pala ng, ng requirement or what. Or minor arithmetical errors. So we recalculate and recompute re to see if their total bid is equivalent to the bid as calculated. So we complete the detailed evaluation and work output here is to determine the lowest calculated bid or the highest rated bid. Of course, we know lowest calculated bid is for goods and infra and highest rated bid is for consulting. Next slide. So in case of discrepancy, this is the rule. Diba? If it's bid price in figures versus in words, we follow in words. Total price per item versus unit price for the item times the quantity, we use the unit price uh, for, for the item and quantity. Stated total price versus actual sum of the price of the component items, we use the actual sum of the price. As I said, we recalculate them. Unit cost in the detailed estimate versus unit cost in the BOQ, we follow the unit cost in the uh, BOQ. No contact rule, prohibition on communication with bidders from bid evaluation until the award of the contract. Next slide. So there's this special rule for ano, preference in domestic uh, domestic preference. Applies where the lowest bidder, lowest bid has a foreign component and the next lowest bid has a domestic component. So the lowest foreign bid is increased by 15%. And then the lowest domestic bidder matches the lowest bid for of the foreign bidder. So in domestic preference. Next slide. You will see here in the next slide of the, the computation. So for instance, we have the foreign bidder here who bid 2.653360 million and domestic bid worth uh, 3 million, 3.09492 million. Okay, so obviously the low the, the bid that the foreign bidder has the lower bid. But if we apply, we apply the domestic uh, domestic preference, we inflate the foreign bid by 15%, we increase it by 15%. So 15% of that is 398,000. So add it to that, yung new bid niya will become 3051, 364. So lumalabas mas mataas na si foreign bidder compared to local bidder. So ang gagawin is you will ask the local bidder if he will willing to match the, willing to match the bid of the foreign bidder. So if he's willing to match the bid of the foreign bidder, then you will award the you will award to the domestic bidder at the prior at the bid of the lowest bidder. Match meaning tatanggap instead of yung bid niya na 3009, ang tatanggapin lang niya is 2.653360. Diba? After you inflate it, mas ma mas mababa na si local bidder. Then you do this. You offer to the local bidder the bid given by the foreign bidder award to the foreign bidder if the domestic bidder refuses. So if the domestic bidder refuses to match the bid of the foreign bidder, then you award it to the foreign bidder at the dot price, 2.653360. Next slide. Bid evaluation consulting services, opening and evaluation of the proposals. The period of, for the receipt of bid should be 75. Right? A while ago, we discussed 75 from the last day of the posting, the advertisement. So a preliminary examination using a non-discretionary pass fail shall be conducted before the detailed evaluation of the bid. So similar to ano, similar to goods and infra. May pass may preliminary ka muna, presence or absence, and then you go the detailed evaluation. Next slide. So now, now we go to the part of when we're evaluating the consulting. Kasi iba ang way ng pag-evaluate pag, uh, pag ng consulting. So pagdating sa consulting, may dalawang paraan. The QBE and the QCPE, quality-based evaluation and quality cost-based evaluation. In quality-based, you only look at the quality of the proposal. Hindi mo ibibigyan ng weight. Hindi mo ibibigyan ng timbang yung cost kung magkano yung bid niya. Pero in quality cost-based, yung cost, yung, yung amount niya, uh, merong weight, uh, may timbang siya uh, when you're doing the evaluation. So two ways, depending on what you want. If it's QBE or Q QCBE. The entire evaluation process from proposal opening to submission of the bid results of the whole shall not exceed 21 calendar days. Next slide. 
So when is it QDE and when is it QCBE? So these are the ano, recommended uh, criteria. Kung kailang ka QTE or kailang ka QCBE. If it's complex or highly specialized assignment for which it is difficult to precisely define the TOR and the required inputs from the consultant, where the assignment can be carried out in many different ways, okay, such that uh, proposals are not comparable, then you use the quality-based evaluation. Okay? Hindi mo na isasama yung cost. If it's very complicated, different, iba-ibang itsura ng, ng proposal. So it's very difficult to, to include the cost. Kasi nga iba. Diba? Very different. Let's say you're designing a, a building. So iba yung way yung, yung pag-design, hindi mo mabibigyan ng yung cost. Makaiba yung cost. Right? So for quality cost-based in any other uh, cases na hindi siya ganun ka-highly specialized. Considers only technical proposals in the ranking, as I mentioned a while ago. Whereas in QCBE, you consider both the technical and the financial proposal in the ranking. Next slide. So paano yung QBE? So submission of the technical and financial proposals. Open the technical proposal. Kasi QBE lang eh. So yung technical lang titignan niya. Hindi niya, hindi niya papansinin yung financial. Right? Evaluation and ranking of the technical proposal. Okay. And then based on the technical proposal, may ranking tayo mamaya i recommend mo na kay back yung approval. No? Kasi you, you evaluate the, the bidder based purely on the technical. I-disregard mo yung financial niya. Ba? And then kung may nanalo na, based on purely on the technical, then afterwards, titignan yung financial. Opening mo yung financial proposal, then you negotiate. Kasi negotiation is a, new, a step applicable to consulting. So yan ay kung QDE. Okay, di disregard yung financial proposal niya. So, wala kang pakialam kung gano'n siya kamahal o gano'n siya kamura. You should only focus him on the technical uh, component. Next slide. So, pag QCBE, then you have to open the technical and the financial. Diba? Open and evaluate the technical and then open and evaluate the financial. For those who are, para siyang ano, parang yung goods and infra, you open first the technical, pag pumasa, then you open the financial. Diba? Sa, sa goods and infra, you open the technical envelope first, envelope one, and then pag okay na envelope one, kompleto, before you open envelope two. So ganun din here. Now you open envelope two for those who comply with envelope one. And then in the ranking and determination of the highest bid, kasama yung financial component and the technical component. And then yun nga, diba? And then you, you, you have it approved. And then after you approve, you negotiate with the highest rated bid. So this difference in QCBE kasama sa evaluation yung cost kung magkano. So nakaka-affect sa ranking niya later on yung cost. Okay, whereas yung QBE hindi nakaka-affect sa ranking niya yung cost. Pwedeng mahal na, masyadong mataas o mahal, still siya yung mananalo. Next slide. So there are two there are two different uh ways of evaluating in consulting. Diba? Pwedeng individual, each back members, para siyang uh, beauty pageant, each back member will give the ano, scores. Diba? Para ka nang judge itong beauty, beauty pageant. Pero uh, each of the judge will give, be given a score sheet, tapos rank sila, tapos i-ano mo siya. Or pwedeng collegial. Uh, back members evaluate and decide as a group. And rate the rate is the consensus of the evaluator. So the bidder should be furnished the results. The results after the evaluation is approved by the book. Results are also posted in the field jobs and the website of the procurement. Okay. So two kinds of evaluation. Next slide. So do you see here, no, ganyan. So di ba, para siyang, para siyang you know, beauty, beauty contest, so evaluator A, B, C, D, E. Okay, laban, tapos may limang, let's say, back members. So they will give the, the, the grade. They will give the grade. So we give the grade and then they will, will have the average, di ba? And then you will, you will rank. Kung, yeah, parang, parang contest na kung ano yung score. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Next, yan. So, so in, in consulting, to eliminate bias, to eliminate bias, bago mo kunin yung, kukunin mo yung average kanina, di ba? Average mo siya. Then afterwards, 
kailangan mong to eliminate bias, kailangan mong alisin yung highest score at lowest score ng kada uh, lowest score and highest score ng kada kada bidder. No? So you remove to, to eliminate bias. So you have to cancel cancel the lowest and the highest score per bidder. So pagkatapos mo ni disregard, ni cancel in lowest score and highest score per bidder, then you 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 rank it. And you get the average and you rank it. Eliminate bias. So that's how you rank it. And ito yung masusunod. Itong itong uh, ano, itong revised na computation. Next slide. So, paano yung criteria? Paano yung criteria for judging? Diba? Ito yung criteria for judging. Quality of the personnel. You can give a weight of 30 to 70%. Okay. Experience and capability, 10 to 30%. Plan of approach and methodology, 20 to 40%. Oral presentation may be required for complex or unique undertaking. Papapresent ko pa yung mga bidders kung paano yung concept niya, ano yung design niya, and all that. Bago ka mag-evaluate. Mag, mag, so there is that option. Again, iba to compared to goods and infra. Walang ganito sa goods and infra. Okay, so this is the criteria. Okay, of course, it's up to the back uh, how they would assign the ano, how would they assign the, the ranking and the grades, the weights uh, for this. Next slide. For QCBE, may cost. The back computes the ratings of each financial proposal in the following manner. Paano yung, kasi pag QCBE, kasama yung cost. So, paano mo titimbangin yung cost? Diba? So, the lowest score, the lowest financial proposal, perfect score siya. Diba? Perfect score yung nagbigay ng lowest sa kanila. And then, from there, mo i-derive yung scores ng mga ibang uh, ibang mga uh, proposals. Other financial proposals are scored using the formula. So, si lowest proposal, perfect score. Ay yung ibang mga proposal, Yung mga ibang proposal, ito yung pag-compute ng kanyang score. Ibibase mo siya dun sa 100. So 100 times uh, lowest financial proposal over financial proposal under consideration. Yun yung magiging score niya. Sa so financial component. Diba? Kasi may bigat, may timbang yung financial component. Next slide. So kanyari ito, so si firm 2 ang lowest bidder. Uh, lowest yung financial proposal niya, 1 million. So 100 points siya. Diba? 100 points ka agad si firm 2. Tapos, yung ibang mga firms, i-derive mo yung kanyang score. Diba? Kunyari, si firm 1, ang bid niya is 1.1 million, so it's 100 times yung 1 million, yung lowest bid over yung 1.1 na binid niya. Diba? And then yung si firm 3, ganun, yung denominator yung 1.5. Diba? So you will see here, si firm 3 yung pinakamataas yung financial bid, 1.5 million yung bid niya, so yung kanyang score is the lowest, 66.7 lang yung score niya. So, ganun yun. Paano mo ma-derive yung score sa financial? Tapos ito, isasama mo to later on dun sa quality. Tapos ipagsasama-sama mo siya sa pag-compute. The point is, may component yung ano. So, since lowest bid ng bid yung bid ni firm, 200 points siya. Diba? Nakakahila, nakakahatak sa kanyang score later on. Pag isasama mo siya dun sa quality component. Next slide. So, how to compute the total score? So, the total score is... Yun na, kunyari, sa firm 2, di ba? So, dito kay firm 2, 100 points siya sa financial. Ang binigay natin sa financial, 70-30 kunyari. 70 for quality, 30 for financial. So, yung, yung sa 30 niya, 100 points siya. So, 100 times 30%. Tapos sa, sa, sa quality, 84.2 yung nakuha niya. So, times sa 70. So, you, you, will, ano, you will add that. Yung total score niya is 88.94. Ganun siya. How do you compute? Ito is QCBE. Kasi nga, 30% of the score came from the financial. Whereas kung ano lang to, kung, kung quality-based lang to, they, it is disregard mo yung financial, yung score niya is the 84.2. Diba? Yun na yung pinaka-score niya. Kasi quality lang talaga yung titignan mo. Ganun siya. Okay? QCBE. Next slide. And then afterwards, then you go negotiation. You, you negotiate with the highest rated uh, bid. Negotiation with any one consultant should be completed within 10 calendar days. Next slide. And then post qual. Okay, siningit lang natin yung ano. Siningit lang natin yung discussions on consultant kasi consultancy kasi iba siya sa goods and infra. Pero the last step is the post qual. And everyone is the same na sa post qual. Okay, goods, infra, consulting, lahat may post qual. 
Okay? So for post-qual, to determine whether the LCB or AHRB complies with and is responsive to all requirements and conditions specified in the bidding documents. So from pag nakapasa sila sa post-qual, they will be called uh, a lowest calculated responsive bid or the highest rated responsive bid. So a non-discretionary passport criterion should be used to validate. So anong purpose ng post-qual? Ang purpose ng post is to validate, verify, validate, and ascertain all statements and documents in the submitted by the lowest calculated bid and highest rated bid. Diba? So validate, diba? to verify, and to ascertain kung accurate ba. Diba? We do not just accept it on face value. So if they submit this, we will verify. If they say they have three projects with DPWH, we will check with DPWH if they really have three projects and there are no problems with the project, everything is in it's a, it's, a, it's a validation. The idea is to, to verify and to, to verify if it's accurate and also to validate if it's accurate. And assert that it must be completed within 12, uh, 12 calendar days. Okay? 12 calendar days or sa, uh, for, for goods and infra, we have a maximum of 45 calendar days. And in, in exceptional cases, you can extend as approved by the hook. And then completed within 30 calendar days, exceptional cases upon approval by the hook. 12 calendar days by default, but you can go 45 or 30 days uh, upon approval by the hook. Now, if you need a longer uh, period of time, but that, that's the maximum, hanggang 45 days or hanggang 30 days ka. For, uh, for goods and infra, tapos yung isa for consulting. Next slide. So post -qual, as I said, ayun na. So 12 days ka, not more than 12 days, and then pwede, kung magpa-extend ka sa hope, pwede ka dun sa kanina yung, or up to 45 days na upon approval by the hope. In case of post-disqualification, so iba post -qual mo yung next in line. Diba? You rank them, lowest calculated bid, and then yung next in line, rank 2, rank 3, rank 4, rank 5. So you will post -qual the next one. And then you will have the same 12-day period for the next one. Or again, if you want to extend, you extend until maximum of 45 days. The box shall notify the bidder with the lowest calculated bid that it was determined that you are the lowest calculated bid. So, sabi mo kay bidder, you're the lowest calculated bid and you prepare for post-qual kasi it post-qual ka namin. So, within five days from receipt of the bidder, kailangan niyang isabit yung mga post-qual documents. Example of post-qual documents are the latest income and business tax return, other appropriate licenses and permits required by the law and stated in the bidding documents. Remember a while ago, I said, Kung gusto mo mag-require ng mga additional documents, dito sa post mo i-require. Huwag mo isang isingit doon sa uh, eligibility documents. Okay? Failure to submit any of the post requirements on time shall disqualify the bid, the bidder for award. Should there be a finding against the veracity of the documents submitted, the bid security shall be forfeited. Okay? Let's say may mga falsified documents and all during post -qual, then your bid security will be submitted for forfeited and you may even be penalized, di ba? Uh, criminally for submitting, let's say, falsified or false documents or you misrepresented. Next slide. SEC certification for of registration for foreign bidders. So there's a requirement here. So if it's a foreign bidder within uh, GPPB resolution 25-2019, within 10 days from receipt of the notice of award, the, the following document should be submitted before the contract may be awarded. Uh, which is the certificate, the SEC registration of the foreign corporation, or the authority or license from the appropriate government agency or professional reg regulatory body of the professional foreign professionals engaging in the practice of regulated professions and allied professions were applicable. So they have to submit it before the contract may be awarded. Next slide. So award. So tapos na yung post -qual, then we go to the award. So the box should recommend the award to, to, of the whom, of the, uh, to the, to the lowest calculated responsive bid. Kanina it is the lowest calculated bid or highest rated bid. Now it is the lowest calculated responsive bid or the highest rated responsive bid. Why responsive? Kasi yung bid mo was responsive to the needs and requirements of the procuring entity. Hindi lang basta lowest. Kailangan lowest and responsive. Diba? Paano siya naging responsive? Kasi dumaan na siya sa post na validate mo na siya, na-verify mo na siya, and it is responsive. 
the box shall notify all the other bidders in writing of the recommendation to the hope to award to the LCRP or the HRRB within three calendar days. So the other bidders should also know kung sino yung nanalo. It was, the, the award of the contract must be uh, within 15 calendar days. Now, 15 days from approved to approved or disapproved by the, the hope. So the back will submit to the hope. The hope has the discretion to approve or disapprove the contract. Hindi naman lahat na porke na approve, na, na recommend ng back, i-approve ni hope. So meron din basis si hope na uh, to approve or disapprove yung contract. Uh, may sarili siyang criteria kung kung i-approve niya or disapprove niya yung, yung contract under 9184. Next slide. So posting, no? Yung award of the contract, yung notice of award shall be posted where? In the bulletin board, in the field of website, and in the website of the government agency. Notice of the award or notice of award or no one within three days from the no issuance of the date of the notice of award must be posted. Next slide. Our award of the contract is subject to the following conditions within 10 days from issuance of the NOAA. So if the JV, you submit a joint venture agreement. If it's a procurement by a foreign Philippine foreign post, the field jobs registration number. If foreign funded, and stated in the treaty, the pickup license, posting of performance security, diba? signing of the contract. And if required, the contract may be, be mentioned at the start of the lecture. If it requires approval of the higher of the higher authority, then the contract should be approved by a higher authority, like the board in a GOCC, for instance, if it's required. Next slide. And this is an important case, Hakomil versus Abaya. According to Hakomil versus Abaya, Hakomil versus Abaya, the law requires a three-month period. Procurement process from opening of the bids to award of the contract should not exceed three months. Three months, no, not 90 days. So three months. This three-month period, according to Hakomil versus Abaya, is mandatory requirement. You have to follow. Hindi pwedeng kung, kung kailan mo lang gusto. Hanggang kailan mo lang gusto. And you extend, extend, extend. The different periods provided in 9184 within which certain stages, remember I told you, the boom is ang tumakbo yung metro, the moment you advertise and then may 15 days, may 30 days, 45 days, yun, very strict yun. Diba? If you don't follow, and yung kabuuan should not exceed 30 days. Kasi the different periods provided by 9184 within which certain stages of the procurement process may be, must be completed is not merely directory but mandatory. Thus, that irregularly rendered procurement Thus, it concluded that such irregularly rendered the, procur rendered the procurement process null and void. If you don't follow, if you don't follow this three-month maximum in the different periods, then it would render the whole procurement process null and void, according to Hamil versus Abaya. Okay, so it's not just this just discretionary, hindi lang siya ano, recommended uh, period. It is a mandatory period that everyone would have to follow. Okay, next slide. So, award of the contract under a re-enacted budget. In case it is a re-enacted budget, so to clarify that agencies may award the contract during re-enacted budget under certain instances. So, the, the procuring entity did not have to wait for the new GAA to be enacted. If, if Assuming it's a re-enacted budget. So, for instance, issued in December 2018 in anticipation to the re-enacted budget in 2019. These guidelines are applicable in any and future instance of a re-enacted budget. So in case of a re-enacted budget, this is what we have to do. You have to award the contract during the re-enacted budget. Next slide. So for purposes of awards of contract under the re-enacted budget, the 15-day period for the hope to approve and issue the notice of award and the three-month period within which to complete the procurement process shall be told. Okay. Period of time for the award of the contract and termination and procurement process shall begin to run again upon the effectivity of the new GAA. Okay. The validity of bids, the bid security shall be extended at the option of the bidder to adjust to the new procurement timeline in case the period is stalled pending the enactment of a, a new GAA. So while you're waiting for the new GAA to be enacted, you do not, you do not count the three-month period and the 15-day period to approve 
the notice of award. Next slide. Performance security. A while ago, we discussed bid security. It is for you to, to guarantee that you will not back out of the project, of the, of the bidding. Now, if you're awarded, if you're selected as the, the lowest calculated responsive bid or the highest rated responsive bid, then you need a performance security. For what purpose? For to the purpose to guarantee the performance of the obligation, that you will finish the project. Kalina is you will not back out from the, from the bidding. Now you now that you're the winner, then you will not you will not you will finish, but you will finish the project. So there are different forms of the performance security. Where they come out, uh, where they come out, cash or manager's check. Okay, if it's goods and consultancy, five percent of the contract price. If it's infra, ten percent of the contract price. Where they come out, surety bond, not less than thirty percent uh, of the contract price. If you fail to post the performance security, then it will be a ground for your disqualification. In the next round, uh, LCB and HR, uh, HRB will be under will undertake post qualification, and the bid security shall be forfeited okay, if you do not give your performance security. Next slide. So, ito ito yung bago. Pwede ka magkaroon ng performance security declaration. Bago lang to because of ano. Resolution number 16-2020, Performance Securing Declaration. So there is a template, there is a format on how a performance securing declaration to be, to be uh, drafted. So similar to the PSD used in the framework agreement, such declaration shall state that the winning bidder shall be automatically disqualified from bidding of any procurement contract for a period of one year for first offense or two years for second offense upon receipt of the blacklisting order. Okay. In the event it violates any of the conditions stated in the contract, an unauthorized PSD may be accepted, subject to submission of a notarized PSD, unless the same is replaced with the performance security in the prescribed form. So this is a new innovation again uh, due, due to due to quarantine restriction. Uh, uh, performance security declaration are allowed because baka nahirapan kumuha ng performance security sa mga banko at sa mga surety. So ina allow ang performance security declaration. Next slide. So contract signing. So once you've awarded the contract, in cases where an approval of a higher authority is required, then may additional 20 days ka to approve or disapprove the contract. And kung may ma let's say the a higher approval is required and then GOCC board siya, then 30 days to approve or disapprove the, the contract. Okay. Uh, next slide. All right, attorney, we are down to our fourth knowledge check question. So may I ask for our technical team to flash our question? There you go. The question is, where should procuring entities from the executive branch upload their advertisement and post award information? Letter A, Phil Jeps. Letter B, Phil Jeps and social media platforms of the procuring entity. Letter C, Phil Jeps, official website and social media platforms of the procuring entity. All right, I think we reached the majority. Majority of our participants from Zoom uh, platform answered letter C. I can also see that our um, Facebook Live viewers participants answered letter C. Let us see, po. let us all see if that is indeed the correct answer, attorney. Yes, no, that is the correct answer. What's the question again? question. Yes, that's the correct answer. No, where should the procuring entity 
uh, upload their, exec their advertisement and post award information. We discussed a while ago. It should be in the field jobs, in the agency's website, and also in the uh, social media platform of the procuring entity for purposes of transparency. Thank you, Attorney. So at this point, Paul, we may now proceed to the final part of our lecture proper. Okay, so we're now in the last step or the last stage no, of the... We're now in the last stage or the last step of the procurement process, which is the notice to proceed. So now, now, now approve name contract. So the next step is to tell the bidder then approve name contract and the, the, to give the bidder a uh, notice to proceed. So it must be posted in the uh, within 15 days from date of the issuance of the NTP and the contract, you know, the bulletin board, the field just website and the uh, agency's website. Uh, it must be issued seven days from the date of approval uh, of the contract. All notices called for by the terms of the contract should be effective only upon the receipt thereof by the successful uh, bidders. So, yeah, next slide. Posting. So, natin ni post the NOAA and the NTP, along with the contract, are required to be posted at the website of the field jobs, website of the agency, and a conspicuous place within three calendar days and 15 calendar days from the respective date of issuance. Okay, so this must be posted in this uh, in the in the website in the in the bulletin board as well as in the uh, field jobs website. Next slide. Additional transparency requirement of post award information, posting of procurement documents, field jobs, agency's website, and social media platform. Remember the Q&A a while ago? So social media platform, GPB resolution number 4-2021. Newspaper. Ito, isa pa to na bago. No? For ABCs of 50 million and above, post-award information shall be published once in a newspaper of general circulation, GPPB Resolution 4-2021. Okay? Post-award information, 50 million and above. Pati sa newspaper. Okay? Next slide. So ito yung kanina, no? Executive Department, GOCCs and GFIs, State Universities and Colleges. Post-award information shall be published once in newspaper of general circulation. This is a new requirement under 4-2021 for projects about 50 million. Next slide. Failure of bidding. So when is there a failure of bidding? The box should declare a failure of bidding when no bids are received. Bids are received, but no one was eligible. All bids failed to post-qualify. Refusal of the post-qualified bidder to accept the award without justifiable costs. So, magkakaroon ka ng failure of bidding. Siyempre, pag walang sumali, or lahat bumagsak, di ba? Or yung nanalong bidder refused to accept the award without justifiable costs. So, ano mangyayari? Then, you will have to review, di ba? You need to review. Bakit walang sumali? Di ba? Bakit lahat bumagsak? Di ba? Bakit lahat bumagsak sa post-qual? So, based on the findings, the back shall revise the terms and conditions and specifications. So, maybe there's something wrong with our TOR. There's something wrong with our scope of work, diba? adjust the ABC, subject to required approval, or then of course you have to have a rebidding and the advertisement. You have to do everything all over again, right? If there's a failure of bidding. Next slide. Cancellation. Cancellation of procurement activities. So under the rules, itong one, two, three, nandiyan na yan, diba? we've, we've been studying this before. Cancellation or termination of procurement activities under what circumstances may procurement activities be cancelled or terminated? Let's say the physical and economic conditions have changed and the project is no longer required or the project is no longer necessary as determined by the end user unit. Diba? Bigla nagbago, let's say nagbago ng isip yung hope. Project, hindi na kailangan or nagbago na yung uh, prices ng project. The source of the funds has been withheld or reduced through no fault of the procuring entity. Diba? Uh, Na-realign yung budget na nagamit na sa ibang ano yung pondo. Ito yung fourth. Ito yung bago. No? 
brought about by the declaration of a state of calamity or implementation of community quarantine or special restriction. This can be used as a ground to cancel or terminate the procurement activities. Diba? If there's state of calamity or implementation of the community or quarantine or similar restrictions. Resolution, GPB resolution number 9-2020. Next slide. Reservation clause. Remember, a while ago I mentioned yung head of the procuring entity, hindi naman niya kailangan i-approve lahat ng i-recommend sa kanya ng back. Right? Meron siyang discretion to approve or disapprove yung recommendation ng, ng back. And in yun reservation clause. Siyempre, pag mag-disapprove siya, dapat meron din grounds. What are the grounds na mag-disapprove yung head of the procuring entity ng recommendation ni back? So the whole preserves the right to reject any and all bids, declare a failure of bidding, or not award the contract. On what grounds? On prima facie evidence of pollution. Diba? Uh, the, the back is found to have failed to in following the prescribed bidding procedures. Or for justifiable reasons, the award of the contract will not redound uh, to the benefit of the government. So in what cases, ano to mga justifiable uh, reasons? Like physical and, and economic conditions have significantly changed. Project is no longer necessary. Source of funds for the project has been uh, withdrawn or reduced. So in which case, pwede niyang uh, hindi na i-award to reject, to declare a failure of bidding or not award the contract. So these are the grounds for the hope naman, from the, from the side of the hope, not to award the contract or not to approve basically the contract. Next slide. Finally, we are down to the fifth and final knowledge check question for this virtual learning session. And the question is, Which is a valid ground for the cancellation of procurement activity by the BAC under GPPB resolution number 09-2020? Letter A, change in management. Letter B, unavailability of PE's website, social media, and Phil Jeff's website. Letter C, brought about by the declaration of a state of calamity or implementation of community quarantine or similar restriction, or letter D, none of the above. Also, Paul, no, for questions related, take note of that, related to our learning session, please drop them through our Zoom chat box or Facebook Live comment section as our resource speaker shall answer them later in our open forum. All right, attorney, majority of our participants answered letter C, both for, um, in our uh, Zoom and Facebook Live. Yes, yeah, so that is correct, no? Which is a valid ground for cancellation of the procurement activity we enumerated a while ago. So, ito lang yung valid ground, yung number four, yung sinabi kong bago, brought about by the declaration of a state of calamity. Uh, brought, brought about by the state of calamity or implementation of community quarantine or similar restriction. Because the other, the other items here are no, not, not valid grounds no, to cancel the, the procurement. All right. Thank you very much, Attorney. I think that ends our discussion proper. That was Attorney Gerard Chan of Privatization and Management Office. And again, thank you very much Paul, for leading the discussion on standard bidding procedures for goods infrastructure projects, and consulting services. Of course, to our participants po for actively participating in our knowledge check portions, thank you very much. Now, before we proceed to the much-awaited open forum, let us first have a quick break. Sa mga hindi pa po nagkakape, nakakapagkape, or any hot drinks, or even um, um, our morning snacks, we may now do so po. Let us just be back po after um, perhaps five minutes. Thank you, and see you in a short while.
Pare, dumating na yung playhouse ng mga bata. I-assemble na namin. Ayos! Kailangan mo ba ng tulong? Mabusisi yan. Nagtanong pa ako sa engineer para mabuo lang ng maayos. Di na pare, common sense lang to. Kapag kulang ang kapasidad, magpatulong. Kapag kulang ang kakayanan, kumonsulta sa eksperto. Sa gobyerno natin, maaari tayong kumuha ng mga consultants na makapagbibigay ng gabay, payo o teknikal na suporta na tutugon sa pangangailangan ng ahensya. Ang pag-hire ng consultant ay dapat nakaayon sa proseso upang matiyak na ang procurement ay sulit. Hindi komplikado ang procurement, basta gawing masusi ang pagpaplano at sundin ang prosesong itinakda ng Republic Act 9184. Ang RA 9184, mas kilala bilang Government Procurement Reform Act o GIPRA, ay ang batas na nagtakda ng tamang proseso sa pagpili ng mga consultants ng gobyerno. Consulting service ang tawag sa serbisyo na ginagampana ng mga eksperto mula sa mga pribadong kumpanya o pribadong individual. Nagsisimula sa procurement planning ang proseso para matukoy ang prioridad ng gobyerno. Dito inaalam ang mga kakailangan ng eksperto na tutulong sa ahensya. Dapat ding tandaan na binibigyang prioridad ang ekspertong Filipino at sinisigurong walang conflict of interest. Nagriresulta ang procurement planning sa APP ng ahensya. Uulitin natin, anong mang hindi nakalista sa APP ay hindi maaaring ipagawa ng ahensya. Para masigurong wasto at matalino ang paggamit ng pondo. Bago simula ng pagpili, dapat mag-conduct ng pre-procurement conference. Dito tutukuyin kung handa na ang lahat ng requirements at kung kumpleto na ang mga dokumento para sa procurement. Susunod na ang advertisement and posting. Ang ahensya ay magpo-post ng Request for Expression of Interest o REI para hikayatin ang mga eksperto na sumali sa eligibility and shortlisting process. Nasasaad dito ang mga detalye tungkol sa proyekto at ang kriteriya na gagamitin sa shortlisting. Shortlisting? Ito ang paraan ng pagsasala upang matiyak kung sino ang pinakamahusay at may pinakanaaayong experience para sa proyekto. Aalamin ang mga eligible consultants base sa sinumiting eligibility documents gamit ang simpleng pass or fail preliminary examination. Sa shortlisting, binibigyan ng score or rating at nirarank ang eligible consultants base sa shortlisting criteria. Tatlo hanggang pito sa mga na-shortlist ang iimitahan na mag-submit ng kanilang bid. Score? Rating? Wala namang ganyan sagot sa TINFRA! Tama! Sa procurement ng consulting services lang gumagamit ng numerical scoring o rating. Bago ang takdang araw ng pagsumiti ng bids, magkakaroon ng pre-bid conference kung saan pag-uusapan kasama ang shortlisted bidders ang lahat ng detalye tungkol sa proyekto. Ang shortlisted bidders ay dapat paalalahanan sa deadline ng submission of bids dahil bawal tanggapin ang late bids. Ang bid o proposal ay maglalaman ng dalawang hiwalay at selyadong envelopes na may mga required technical at financial documents. Ang technical proposal ay naglalaman ng mga dokumentong technical patungkol sa proyekto. Ang financial proposal naman ay naglalaman ng presyo ng bid at mga impormasyong pinansyan. Ang layunin ng bid evaluation ay matukoy ang highest rated bid o HRB gamit ang napiling klase ng evaluation procedure. Quality-based o quality-cost-based? Teka, teka! Ano yung quality-based at quality-cost-based? Relax! Tulad sa shortlisting, ang mga bids o proposals ay i-evaluate gamit ang numerical scores o rating. Sa quality-based evaluation, technical proposal lang ang binibigyan ng score na magiging basihan ng ranking ng bidders. Pero ang financial proposal ay di pa rin dapat mas mataas sa ABC o approved budget for contract. Sa quality cost-based evaluation, ang kabuuan ng scores ng technical at financial proposals naman ang basihan sa pag-rank ng bidders. Alinman sa dalawang paraang nabanggit, ang bid na may pinakamataas na score ang tataguriang highest rated bid o HRB. Kapag natukoy na ang HRB, isasalang na ito sa negotiation at post-qualification. Negotiation? Bago sa pandinig ko yan. 
Sa negosyasyon, pinag-uusapan at nalilinaw ang iba't ibang aspeto ng kontrata. Ah! Tapos, post-qualification na! Oo! Sabay na isinasagawa ang post-qualification sa negosyasyon. Pero gaya sa goods at infra, sinusuri ng back o ng technical working group kung tama na ang mga impormasyong nasa bid ng Highest Rated Bid! Tumpa! HRB nga! Sinusuri rin ang mga nakaraang kontrata ng kumpanya, lalo na ang experience ng mga taong ia-assign sa proyekto. Pati ang pinansyal na katayuan ng HRB ay tinitingnan din. Tapos, awarding of contract na! Ayan! Kuha niya na agad! Madali lang sundan ang proseso ng procurement sa gobyerno. At kapag nagplano ng tama, tiyak na di palpak. Sa ganyang paraan, walang nasasayang. Tiyak! na best quality at the best price ay swak na swak. Approve? Approve! I hope everyone is back po. Can I have a thumbs up po sa ating mga participants if you are all ready to resume? Alright, ayan. While we are on break po, we played a short audiovisual presentation on consulting services. Now, for more quick guide in government procurement and other related short videos and audiovisual presentation, you may visit our official website at www.gppb.gov.ph. Now, to proceed with the course of our program, please be reminded uh, that questions which are initially gathered from the Zoom chat box and from our Facebook Live comment section are filtered. Nevertheless, rest assured that all questions raised and received are documented, which shall form part of our frequently asked questions. Once again, Paul, let us have our resource speaker, Attorney Gerard Chan. And let us now start with our first question. Attorney, the first question is, does letter of intent still required so the prospective bidder can join the pre-bid? Uh... I think no more na, no? There's, there's no need for the letter of intent uh, to be required for the uh, prospective bidder to join the pre -bid. They just have to uh, purchase the bidding documents under the 2016 rules, no? even if you didn't purchase the bidding documents, so you're still in, uh, uh, allowed to, to join the, <clears throat> the pre-bid. But that because under the old rules, you need to purchase the bidding documents. And now under the 2016 rules, you need to purchase the bidding documents. You can attend the pre-bid first before you uh, finally pay for the bidding documents. Yeah, thank you very much po, attorney. Moving forward to our next question. Is short listing also means pre-qualification of bidders? Uh, no more pre no more pre-qualification of bidders, di ba? Under 9184. Ang short listing na ang ginagamit is for consulting. For goods and infra, wala nang pre -qual. Under the old style kasi yata may prequel. Under this 9184, wala na siyang uh, prequalification. Shortlisting is only done for consulting. But consulting, yes, in a way, it's kind of a prequalification. If it's consulting. If it's not consulting, walang prequel, walang shortlisting. Moving forward to our next question. Thank you, attorney. In case of failure of bidding, can the contractor or supplier withdraw their payment for bid docs? Nakalagay kanina sa slides, di ba? In cases of, ano, in cases of uh, failure of bidding due to Section 41, in those cases, pwedeng i-refund yung, yung bid docs. In cases of, of those cases, yun ang pagkakaalak ko. If in all other cases, uh, hindi yata po refundable ang bid docs. Thank you po. Next question, is it considered automatically disqualified if the bid proposal is not properly sealed and marked and there's no representative to acknowledge or certify it? Nakalagay kasi sa rules, not properly sealed or not properly marked should be accepted. Diba? Ang disqualified lang is unmarked and unsealed. Ang problema mo doon, if there's no representative to acknowledge or certify it, then that becomes a problem. Kasi also the requirement is it may be accepted provided there is a representative to acknowledge or certify. So kung wala, then I don't, maybe, maybe that could be a ground to, ano na, to disregard or not accept the bid because kasi nakalagay provided may mag-certify. Eh. 
So hindi naman pwedeng wala nang certify tapos pag binuksan mo may ano sa loob may nawawalang document sa loob. So so I think it it, it may be to to be ano it may be a ground to disqualify. All right, moving forward po to our next question. In case the bidder didn't disclose all his or her ongoing projects, is the bidder automatically disqualified? Yes, it is. It would be a ground for disqualification. Bide ba kasi nakalagay doon? Statement of all ongoing government and private uh, projects. So if you didn't disclose, then that would be ground for disqualification. So you didn't comply with the requirement. All right. Thank you very much, Attorney. Moving forward to our next question. Medyo mahaba po ito. No? Regarding the NFCC, is the bidder considered disqualified or ineligible if the bidder used the previous fiscal year as basis in the computation of the NFCC, whereas there is already an updated comparative statement of condition AFS reflected in, is the bidder reflected in? Is the bidder considered automatically disqualified or ineligible if the bid proposal is not properly sealed and marked and there's no authorized representative of the bidder Acknowledge or certify it. I think it's similar. Yeah, tapos na yung second part. But the yes. first part, sabi niya kasi yung NFCC niya, uh, there is already an updated comparative statement of condition reflected in, in blank na wala. No? Pero kasi ang, ang gagawin ko dito is ano, kung meron na siyang... Kasi kailangan ginamit niya, kung, kung meron naman siyang bagong financial statement, dapat yun ang ginamit niya for the NFCC. Right? If you use the previous year, then hindi na, siya, hindi na accurate yung ano kasi nakalagi based on the audited financial statement. Diba? So, I don't know, you could be, you could be, I know, you could be lenient and use, and use the, the new uh, financial statement and compute the NFCC kung, kung ano pa siya, kung magko-comply pa siya o hindi. Kasi ang kinukuha mo lang naman sa financial statement is the asset and the liability. Diba? The asset and the liability. So, yun, yun lang yung ano, kung magko-comply pa siya sa NFCC. But it, it will depend eh. For me kasi, I would disqualify it kasi very simple lang naman yung requirement eh, di ba? So, ba't hindi pa siya na nakapag-comply? Bakit yung luma yung ginamit ng NFCC? Ah, uh, luma yung ginamit ng financial statement. During the private conference, can the box specify, clarify, and discuss to the prospective bidder the brand of the materials preferred by the end user? So we discussed about a while ago that the brand uh, should, should not be specified in the in the bidding document. So I don't think it would be proper to discuss the preferred brand during the private conference. Because the, the, you can discuss the specifications Diba? but not mention the brand because that is this that is prohibited nga eh, in the in the bidding documents to put the brand so you don't discuss it during the pre-bid conference as well all right thank you very much attorney moving forward to our next question is there a standard set of bid documents for the design and build projects prescribed by the gppb this, this i'm not this i'm not sure no Possible meron. I'm not very sure kasi the standard, there's a separate lecture on the standard bidding documents. Eh. So maybe you could ask this question later on uh, when you have the lecture on the standard bidding documents for, for goods and infra. So I, I would think there would be a standard bidding documents. I think, yeah. But I'm not really 100% sure. All right. I uh, will also provide clarification then po siguro through the Zoom chat box po, no? Or or you may also request for legal consultation po on specific concerns of your municipalities from uh, our office, which details may be viewed in our official um, website. All right, moving forward to our next question. For consulting services, kasama ba sa ibibintang set of bid documents ang terms of reference? Kasama ba sa ibibintang set of bid documents ang terms of reference? Di ba, yeah, di ba kasama siya sa ano? In terms of references included in the bid docs, the buy, I would I would imagine it's part of the bid docs. So, yeah. I think it's it included. No. Yes. 
Moving forward po, attorney, to our next question, can we still apply for the alternative documentary requirements pursuant to GPPB resolution number 09-2020? If so, until when? Can we still apply for the alternative documentary requirements pursuant to? Nakalagay kasi doon, ano eh, uh, nakalagay kasi doon, there must be, uh, there must be, ano by the back eh na allowed yung alternative documentary requirements. The box should specify in the in the in the bid docs or invitation to bid na uh, uh, applicable pa rin yung ano. Kasi nakala ang 9-2020 it was issued at the time of the uh, when there was a strict lockdown, di ba? So at the time talagang walang ano uh, walang walang mga offices, walang mga ano na open. So hindi ka talaga makapag uh, notarize, hindi ka makapagkuha ng mayor's permit and everything. But now no, but now pwede na, 'di ba? Nakakapag-notarize and all. So so nakalagay kasi doon sa requirement, kailangan ni indicate ni back na applicable yung alternative documentary requirements. So the back should specify I think kung applicable or tatanggapin yung alternative method uh, documentary requirements. Kasi nakalagay in a state of calamity or Uh, implementation of a community quarantine restriction. So what does diba, that mean? All right, Bob, moving forward to our next question. Site validation. Affidavit of site validation is part of financial envelope or not required? Financial envelope. This, I'm not sure. I'm not, I, I have to be honest. I don't know. Uh, uh, affidavit of site validation i think it's not required it's not required uh no it's not required in uh part of the financial envelope sige po attorney let's just park this discussion po on this and uh, our event secretary shall provide a clarification for regarding this question no it's not, required. it's not required all right all right moving forward po attorney to the next question do we still need to go through the process of procurement of newspaper of general circulation for projects costing 50 million and above projects. Or we can just choose and get the services of a newspaper of general circulation. In the procure po ba yun? Go through the process of procuring the newspaper of general circulation. Diba, ang requirement ng, you just, you just have to post it uh, in a newspaper of general circulation. So you just choose and get the services of the newspaper of general circulation. I don't think you need to go through the process of um, procuring it. Ipo post po lang siya sa newspaper. Eh. Oops. All right. I believe, attorney, that was our last question. Thank you very much po, attorney. If you have more questions, you may still ask them out by visiting slido.com. All you have to do is just type in the event code hashtag government procurement PH to which the GPPBTSO will answer through an issue once or through FAQ. So at this point, Paul, we'd like to thank again our resource speaker, Attorney Gerard Chan, for graciously accepting for our invitation and for extensively answering the questions raised by our participants. So now, Paul, before we proceed to the final reminders, allow me to provide uh, a recap or bird's eye view of our today's learning session. So today, Paul, we had an entire session on standard bidding procedures for goods, infrastructure projects, and consulting services, where we had a comprehensive discussion on the key concepts in the bidding procedures for the procurement of goods and services, infrastructure projects, and consulting services, where we also highlighted the general principles and considerations for their respective procurement undertakings led by our today's resource speaker, Attorney Gerard Chan. We do hope that you were uh, all able to have a deep dive on the procurement procedures and requirements which would ultimately aid you in the fulfillment of your duties and uh, responsibilities as efficient uh, procurement practitioners in your respective municipality. So for the final important reminders again, we would like to remind the participants to please accomplish the participants' daily attendance form day three by visiting the link provided by our event 
Activity Secretariat. So rest assured po that all the information gathered for this online training shall be treated with utmost confidentiality consistent with the provisions of the Data Privacy Act. And for our early bird winners and knowledge check winners, again, kindly check your respective emails or chat box and kindly respond with the details needed or required. So finally po, for tomorrow, the fourth day of our week-long virtual event, please be reminded that the program shall start at 8 a.m. And we would like to request everyone po again to log in at least 10 minutes before the program so that we can start on time. Also, please be advised that we shall again be using the Zoom platform, which credentials are provided by the uh, Activity Secretariat. For concerns and other matters related to our program, you may directly coordinate with Ms. Jocelyn Bisleg and Mr. Marky Duetes or any of our GPPB TSO secretariat. Finally, may we request for everyone to please switch on their cameras to commemorate this learning session with attorney Gerard Chan. So we shall be having an, again about three shots. Let me just browse through my screen po. Ayan. So for our first shot po, in my count, ready? One, two, and three. For our second shot, ready? One, two, and three. For our last and final shot, ready? One, two, and three. That is it. That concludes the third day of the online training for the Municipal Local Government Units on Government Procurement Reform Act or the Republic Act number 9184 and its 2016 revised implementing rules and regulations. On behalf of the Government Procurement Policy Board Technical Support Office, this has been your facilitator, Monica Marie Sadia. Thank you all very much and see you all again tomorrow. Thank you po, Attorney Chan. Thank you very much, Attorney Gerard. Malis na yata. <laughs> Ang bilis. Galing. Message mo na lang siya, Te. Yes. Thank you.